The Fed is going to keep rates higher for longer, and that puts more pressure on the economy. I do believe that the monetary conditions are not tight. Yes, we're probably going to have uh, slightly higher inflation, and yes, we're going to have higher interest rates, but to us, that's not that bad a problem. The economy has demonstrated that it can live with these interest rates. Financial conditions have been tightening to some degree. Overall, uh, the picture remains fairly positive. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. More than 40% of the S&P 500 reporting earnings this week. It's a monster week of earnings. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Your equity market on the S&P 500. Six day losing streak. Can we break that? We're positive by 0.5%. It's all about the Canada this week. It's all about the tech earnings, the MAG7. Let's go through it piece by piece. Tuesday, tomorrow, Tesla. On to Wednesday, Meta. Thursday, Bramo, Google and Microsoft. To me, it's going to be really interesting to see whether even a beat is sort of a disappointment to markets because so far that has been the tone. We have gotten the biggest sell-off in the MAG7 going back to late 2022. Have we already priced out that potential disappointment and were we set up for a positive upside surprise or is this a pivot point at a time of a lot of uncertainty? Well, let's pick out a single name that's facing a lot of uncertainty. Let's talk about Tesla. We're down by 2.4% this morning. I think we're down by more than 40% year to date. And we start this week, AMH, we start this week with another round of price cuts. Absolutely. A string of bad news is coming to Tesla. And tomorrow they're supposed to report first revenue decline in four years. So this is going to be a challenging earnings call for Elon Musk. It's not just the cuts across the board, China, Europe, and the U.S. Really important, though, when you look at their Chinese and U.S. market, but also the job cuts. And the fact that they're trying to basically pin their future on this robo-taxi that there remains a ton of questions about. Honestly, to me, I just keep thinking to myself, is this really a situation of a car company that is trying to mask itself as something else? And are people going to come to that realization? The fact that we're looking at a 40 percent plunge in operating profits is pretty substantial. Tesla coming up in the next 24 hours. Need to talk about the bond market as well. Yields a little bit higher here by a single basis point on a two year, on a 10 year up by three basis points. Let's call it 466. Last week, the week when Fed officials wandered out loud, are we restrictive enough? It finally started to happen. The conversation began to shift. And frankly, they were just following the market. And it didn't actually disrupt the market as much as I would expect, which really just highlights how much the market has already priced out cuts and done the Fed's work for it. The big question over the weekend is, does this Federal Reserve need to completely change its communication strategy? Because right now, it ain't working. And I think a lot of people would agree with that. You called it the pivot on the pivot last well, week. She calls it the U-turn. And okay. to me, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, you can call it whatever you want. The big issue is they're losing credibility because their communication strategy is failing. All means the same thing, doesn't it? They've had to go around in circles over the last few weeks or so. Let's kick it off with a price action. We've talked about the bond market. Let's go to equities. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Look a little something like this. Positive on the session, coming off the back of a week of losses. We're up by 0.6%. The Nasdaq 100 coming off the back of its worst day of the year. Tech on Friday. Bramo absolutely hammered NVIDIA down by 10%. And it was because super microcomputer announced its earning date without forward guidance, which, again, to think that that torpedoed everything and those shares were down something like a quarter of a percent. This is what we got set up for this week. First of all, we don't have Fed speak, which I think is important. Earnings take center stage, front and center, 178 S&P 500 companies reporting earnings. As uh, John was mentioning, we do get Tesla on Tuesday, Meta on Wednesday, as well as Microsoft and Alphabet and a little bit of Intel on Thursday. How much does that set the tone? When it comes to the data, it is all Friday. We get the PCE in the personal spending and income report. How much does this confirm the reinflationary narrative uh, that we get? And in the absence uh, of Fed speak, we get auctions. And I just want to say a lot of people are focused on these auctions. They are record auctions. $69 billion of two-year notes on Tuesday, $70 billion of five-year notes on Wednesday, and $44 billion of seven-year notes on Thursday at a time where yields are at the highs of the, of the year. And are the buyers going to come in? A ton of supply a little bit later this week. A little bit later this hour, coming up, Dean Kernard of Macro Risk Advisors with Max 7 Earnings on deck. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy as U.S. lawmakers take aim at TikTok. And Al Salinas of RBC on King Dollars, Big Rain. We begin with our top story. U.S. stocks looking to bounce back from the worst week of the year. Dean Kernard of Macro Risk Advisors saying this. I'm more diversified than I thought I was, said absolutely no one amidst the market risk-off event. 
Dean Kerner joins us now for more. Dean, wonderful to catch up with you, sir, going into a critical week for earnings from big tech. Let's just talk about the performance of MAG7, the tech cohort that's dominated this market for so long. Dean, what are you learning about what's happening there? Yeah, I think um, the performance, obviously, of MAG7 has been unbelievable. I think what has been even more um, special in terms of owning this particular um, you know, group of stocks has been the correlation properties uh, of the stocks. They've been uh, incredibly strong in terms of their performance, but they've also been unusually and I would say unsustainably low in terms of their correlation with each other. Um, you know, when we look at the volatility of the S&P, we're looking at two things at, one, at once. One is the volatility of the stocks in the S&P, and the second is the correlation of those stocks. Um, you just mentioned NVIDIA went down 10 percent basically on nothing. On Friday, uh, Apple was just down a percent. And Microsoft was down a percent. If we go back to the big upshock in NVIDIA earlier this year, that 16 percent up move, that was also really in isolation. And uh, the quote you read from me, uh, Jonathan, was really just this idea that I think what happens over time is that investors tend to um, certainly they price their risk. They, they price how much they own based on the realized volatility of that asset. And as I said, the realized volatility of the S&P 500 has been unusually and unsustainably low because of this incredibly uh, muted level of correlation across these you know, three or four stocks. And I think that's really the fragility in the market is just this idea that these stocks just move in isolation, that there's no macro factor that's going to drive the performance of the stocks. Uh, I think that's a vulnerability for, for investors. It didn't, given that vulnerability, is that why you're still advocating for downside protection? Yeah. I, I, so, so, you know, the market's going through a transition right now. You know, the VIX popped up to 18 to 20. Uh, it's, it's a lot higher than it was, but obviously we've seen periods where it's been considerably higher than that as well. I think one of the conundrums that investors have right now is that the increase in the VIX has not really been driven by the daily um, the, the, the size of the moves in the S&P. The realized volatility is only 10 or 11. So what you have, uh, and, and it's challenging for investors from an insurance standpoint, is a big spread between the VIX and the realized volatility. And I think that's basically the market um, pricing in uncertainty, uncertainty on the monetary policy front. You guys reviewed just the Fed's potential um, you know, changes in, in, in its language. We're obviously watching the short end of the yield curve and how that embeds um, it's taking the, the cuts out of, uh, out of the curve. And then of course, the geopolitical risk uh, is something that typically is more bark than bite, but it, we've got to pay attention to it. And you know, one of my favorite quotes is from Stanley Druckenmiller. He said, the best economist I know is the stock market. And I would say I'd broaden that out to just the level of risk premium. You can really learn a ton by just analyzing implied volatility. And I would say, Jonathan, these prices are just singing right now. You know, gold... Uh, has rallied substantially, and it's rallied in the face of a stronger dollar. Very atypical. Gold implied volatility is up a ton, even as gold is rallying. These are things that are telling us about an underlying risk dynamic where the market's trying to understand things. It hasn't yet. Uh, still holding this economy up as a consumer that's ready and willing to spend and corporate profits that have been robust. So I do think that there's you know a lot to be said about this upcoming uh, series of, of quarterly reports coming as well. Dean, you're not the only person who we're going to be speaking to today who suggests that right now, if you listen to the market signals, they are telling you that we are at some sort of inflection point. Michael O'Rourke is going to be coming up later, and he's got a similar kind of idea. What do you think this says about the relationship then between bonds and stocks? Is this a point where higher yields is bad news for the stock market? And frankly, people are not digesting the good news is good news in the same kind of way, meaning that any upside surprise, either on earnings or on economic data could be problematic. Well, I, I think there's something to that, that at some point the rise in the 10 year and the, the taking out of these cuts from the, the short end of the curve uh, in tandem is something that's gonna test the stock market's resiliency. Now, remember, if we go to around this time last year, we were post SVB and the market actually priced in a number of cuts towards the end of 2023, those didn't materialize and the stock market did quite well. Uh, so it, it's not, uh, it, it, you know, it's not for sure that if the, the Fed's got to stay the course in terms of, you know, keeping rates where they are, that the risk asset complex buckles. Um, the U.S. economy has just proven completely resilient. I think one of the things I just scratch my head every time that 
is not enough of a part of the conversation around the essentially inability of monetary policy to tame the economy is just the degree of deficit spending. I mean, we're spending 7%, uh, you know, more than we take in during a, with a 3.8% unemployment rate. It's pretty unsustainable. And I think the issue, I think, for investors is when we look at government bonds as a stabilizer in the portfolios, you've got a push and pull. You've got, as you mentioned earlier, this incredible supply that's coming. I think it's testing investors' ability to, to take it down. You've got unsustainable deficits that uh, I think are certainly getting a lot of attention. And then, of course, the bond market does want to rally based on geopolitical risk. So I don't know that you're going to be able to count a lot on stock bond correlation uh, as you as you have in the past. Yeah. And then, you know, of course, because you can't, you've got to really focus a lot more on option strategies uh, than just using bonds as a diversifier. When you take a step back, Dean, and just put it all together, this week we do have these sort of three prongs. We've got the economic data, we have the earnings, which are the tremendous, the sort of true test of the MAG-7, uh, and then we do have those auctions. What are you looking at that can kind of give us a sense of where we're going at this inflection point? Well, look, I think price is going to tell us a lot, you know, and, and I think what you're trying to do is um, is read what the market's telling you. So if you get a bad auction, and, and we you know, we've seen these in the past, where suddenly we're, we're talking a lot more about auctions, and the S&P goes down a lot based on that auction, it's telling you about what a market level of, of discomfort, right? Um, of course, the data itself has become critical again. You know, core PCE on Friday, obviously everybody's going to be watching. Um, those were big data releases for a period of time in 2022, not so much in 2023. They're starting to become, you know, more critical as well. Um, and again, I think we're supposed to watch these other assets like oil and gold for indication of, of just market market discomfort. And look, what I would just say is 2%, uh, sorry, 5% uh, two-year note yield, it kind of harkens back to the T-bill and chill strategy, right? You know, you're, you're kind of paid to wait in a way that you weren't uh, for a long time. So I think you're supposed to really, um, you know, think about what you can earn uh, in the short end of the yield curve, at least for now, amidst a lot of uncertainty in the market. We've heard that a few times over the last week, that's for sure. Dean, thank you, sir. Dean Kernard there of Macro Risk Advisors. Bramo went through the auction slate this week. Let's do it again. Two-year notes come in tomorrow, $30 billion worth. After that, $70 billion of five-year notes, $44 billion of seven-year notes. There's some record auctions on some of those maturities. Bramo, this was a big feature of the conversation last week. America's deficit, the sustainability of U.S. exceptionalism, the disruption that it could cause the rest of the world. And a lot of people didn't have answers of exactly what that disruption would be because no one was about to say, OK, this is it. It's really going to matter. And suddenly the U.S. is going to lose the privilege to uh, borrow recklessly, borrow and spend recklessly, as some people would say. The key question to me is you don't know when you hit that threshold. And what we heard from Seth Carpenter over the weekend of Morgan Stanley was basically we're going to hit an inflection point when it comes to interest payments. But we don't know where it is. We're just bumping up against that dangerous point. And the question a lot of people can't answer, but most of them think it's going to be a market issue then then forces Washington to get their act together instead of Washington saying, OK, we know this is unsustainable. Look at what the IMF put out, a rare warning about the United States. Let's do something and be proactive. I don't think so. It's going to be a mess in the market that then trickles down to Washington. The bond yields very close to the highs of the year. We're high by three basis points or so. On a 10-year maturity, the yield at the moment, 4.65. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. The New York Stock Exchange is asking stakeholders about their thought on 24-7 trading. That according to the FT. The survey apparently asked respondents whether around-the-clock trading all week plus how they would staff the overnight sessions. Regulators are also assessing an application form that happens by a startup backed by Steve Cohn's 0. 0.72 hedge fund to launch the first ever, uh, the first rather round the clock exchange. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says that Huawei's latest phone shows that China remains behind on chip technology. She was speaking with CBS's News 60 Minutes. Raimondo downplayed the company's claim of a breakthrough. She also said that the tech app shows that the Biden administration has been successful in imposing export controls on China. And a rare Rolex with a split-second chronograph sold for $3.5 million at an auction 
and probably as you would have guessed in Monaco. It's a record price for the model. The Rolex 4113 produced in 1942 is one of just 12 ever made and nine known to exist. The watch has a case diameter of 1.73 inches, making it one of the largest Rolex watches ever made. That's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. So financial conditions are still easy. I think would be the conclusion of some people out there. Up next on the program, the clock ticking on TikTok. The idea that we would give the Communist Party this much of a propaganda tool, as well as the ability to scrape 170 million, American, million Americans' personal data, it is a national security risk. The conversation about that so-called national security risk coming up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. You know what else? season is here. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. Continuing coverage on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Attempting to bounce back and snap a six-day losing streak on the S&P 500. Equity futures positive by 0.6%. Yields a little bit higher by three basis points, 4.65 on a 10-year. Lisa said it earlier. The good news, no Fed speak. It's the quiet period. The Federal Reserve decision the following Wednesday. Next week, Wednesday. Just a week or so away. Bond yields, 4.65 on a 10-year. Under surveillance this morning, the clock ticking on TikTok. The idea that we would give the Communist Party this much of a propaganda tool, as well as the ability to scrape 170 million, American, million Americans' personal data, it is a national security risk. The timeline of giving this can be a complicated transaction, to give it up to a full year, I think just from a business standpoint, makes sense. Here's the latest. The House approving legislation over the weekend requiring parent company ByteDance to divest from TikTok or be banned. The bill attached to an aid package for Ukraine and Israel. The Senate is expected to vote on the measure in the coming days. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy writing this. We're still of the view that the TikTok issue gets dealt with by year's end, but the how matters in the Senate, where the debate has been outright ban versus letting POTUS investigate and figure out specifics on TikTok or any other similar website. Terry, a good friend of this program, joins us now for more. So Terry, you've got to help me out personally. And for anyone else out there who's confused, what is and isn't going to pass in the Senate? Well, the aid package certainly passes. Uh, Ukraine, Israel, the Indo-Pacific, read Taiwan. Uh, there's an, also an awful lot of sanctions uh, and uh, and foreign policy matters that pass, which I view as a uh, uh, congressional rebuke to Biden, essentially to to get more energy and uh, and get moving on foreign policy. Beyond that, on TikTok, uh, you know, I I don't think honestly we know yet. There are two there there are two main approaches. The one is the ban. The other one is okay. Let's uh, give the president the direct authority to evaluate websites generally for uh, for problems similar to that of TikTok, national security problems. Uh, and uh, there's been a debate about that. I my instinct is that the uh, you know the wave kind of washes over the people who want that more nuanced approach, uh, and we get right into the full ban. Uh, but that's very much a live ball in the Senate, and I don't think we're going to know for a couple of days which uh, which approach actually they're interested in taking. If that's the case, it complicates things because then the bill would have to go back to the House for final passage. Terry, in the provision, they extended the amount of time TikTok would have or ByteDance would have to sell or divest from six months to one year. Does that help its chances in the Senate? Yeah, I think it probably does, Anne Marie. The uh, you know you you. Played Senator Warner on the bumper, and uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, you know, th this is looked at as much more of a fairness, uh, uh, fairness and, and business case uh, matter than anything else. Uh, nobody's trying to, to shut off TikTok tomorrow, and it's important for senators to be able to say that as they're voting. You say you're still in the view that tic the TikTok issue gets dealt with by the end of the year. Do you mean dealt with in Congress or dealt with altogether? Because this looks like it's going to have a tremendous amount of legal battles ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I mean, in Congress, uh, the the posture of the United States government on TikTok and what they're going to do about it, uh, the legal case, frankly, I 
I will tell you, I think is overblown. Uh, then the short strokes are that, uh, you know, the uh, site somehow has First Amendment rights and all the rest. This is very much uh, uncharted territory legally in the United States generally. But what the First Amendment fundamentally focuses on are the rights of individuals to speak. And nobody can, uh, you know, nobody's rights to speak on the Internet uh, are going to be uh, negatively affected if they can't do it on one of a billion sites. Terry. If I were cynical, I would suggest maybe the one year time frame pushes this past the election where this becomes an issue that has been dealt with where no one feels the consequences if they are younger and they use TikTok. Is that part of the reason why things were extended to a year? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased you're not cynical, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, the short answer is yes. I, I, I do think that's a. Uh, I do think that's a consideration. I, I also do think that the uh, uh, the business case uh, is the primary reason. But uh, it, you know, accusing United States senators of politics uh, is not a particularly controversial matter. And uh, you know, getting this past the November elections, I think, is uh, is politically important for them. Just talking about uh, the political environment in Washington, D.C., I spent a lot of time thinking about Mike Johnson's transformation, where he was uh, with the camp that didn't want to provide funding to Ukraine, that didn't want to pass any additional spending. And he said that in this article that I was reading about his transformation, he prayed a lot and he came to this conclusion, in part because of certain documents, intelligence documents that he read. Do we have a sense of what intelligence documents really guided some of the decision making that could put his speakership at, at jeopardy? Uh, specifically, no, but uh, there, there are sort of two things at work on Speaker Johnson. I think one is the uh, one is the national, the pure national security case. The idea that uh, you know he got briefed up and and you know from all accounts, uh, everything I've heard, uh, you know, really sought out uh, in just the way you'd want from a senior leader in the Congress. Uh, you know, trying to get the best case and the best view of what the uh, the national security problems were and what the consequences might be the other thing which i think is uh, is underappreciated is that speaker johnson uh, is is a committed christian uh, says so professes so and uh, and the idea that uh, that Russians were uh, were torturing Christians uh, uh, became a uh, became a powerful uh, motivator uh, for him generally, and uh, and increasingly the evangelical community in the United States uh, made that case with Speaker Johnson, and I think that was very important. But again, as I say, underappreciated. Terry, I think we all noticed last week on the sidelines of the IMF World Bank spring meetings that Russian assets are becoming a much bigger focal point going forward, and more specifically, Russian assets being held in Europe, in France, in Belgium. How close do you think we are to an agreement with the Europeans on how to move forward? Oh, I think we're very close. Uh, you know, you've got uh, you've got remarkable consensus in in the United States Congress on this in a way that didn't exist two or three months ago. Frankly, uh, the administration is pushing hard to try to get some uh, get some sort of a modus vivendi on this, and uh, and I think the Europeans are similarly motivated. So you know, you're looking at the uh, the continued weaponization of this sort of uh, this sort of thing in a way that hasn't existed in about 80 years, really. Getting closer and closer to an agreement. Mm -hmm. Terry, thanks for hosting us last week. It's good to see you. Terry Haynes there at Pangea Policy. Terry Haynes down in Washington, D.C., following the IMF World Bank spring meetings last week. AMH, you've got a feeling we were getting closer and maybe getting closer and closer until we get to that G7 leaders meeting in June. I think it's all going to come down at the leaders level because there's a lot of different ways on how to get the money from those assets to Ukraine hands. And a lot of Europeans you speak to, though, are concerned about the precedent that this would set even though they are being pushed by a lot of U.S. officials to come to an agreement. So a few more weeks, and then at the end of the day, the leaders will decide. Some of them are incredibly nervous, as we know. Equity futures on the S&P 500. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Positive here by 0.6%, just a little bit of a lift. If you're looking to the bond market, yields are higher by three basis points, 465 18. Coming up on the program, Tasnim Girwadwala of City. That conversation just around the corner from New York City, looking ahead to a week full of tech earnings and a sprinkle of economic data, concluding with the PCE read at the back end of the week. This is Bloomberg.
Last week was pretty brutal stuff. Equities on a six-day losing streak were bouncing back on the S&P 500 by 0.6%. The Nasdaq coming off the back of its worst day of the year, on the Nasdaq 100 specifically, down 5% last week. Worst week since November 2022, up by 7 tenths of 1% right now. The Russell doing okay, positive 0.6%. So a little bit of a bounce in the equity market, going into a monster week for tech earnings that we'll get to in just a moment. If you switch to the board and turn to the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, two-year yield climbing for four consecutive weeks up again this morning by three basis points lisa on a 10-year 465.38 on a two-year up by almost a single basis point and getting closer and closer again to five percent at 499.28 you know on one hand you've got people saying this is a good place to buy on the other hand you have people who say don't fight momentum and that's the battle that we're going to be looking at the auctions this week do we get more people saying a two-year yield at five percent looks pretty good we get that auction tomorrow or you're going to have more people especially at that seven-year auction on thursday saying hold up we don't understand what's exactly going on under the hood here. I'm not sure even the Fed understands currently, I think you to would, be clear. I would agree. And as Lisa's mentioned already this morning, quiet period for the Federal Reserve. So no Fed speak through this week. Those high yields are fed through to a stronger dollar. I think we all understand that. What maybe we don't understand is what, happen what is happening in the commodity market. So we're pulling back once again on Brent crude by a half of 1%, 86.82. WTI down 0.4%, 82. 81. Crude actually coming off the back of a weekly loss. Mohammed Al Arian in the Financial Times last week said this, when comparing the reaction of markets to the views of most national security experts, I'm reminded of the story of the frog in boiling water. Basically, how can you price something in that hasn't happened yet? And yet tension has not faded away. We've kept talking about that again and again. Maybe we didn't get necessarily some sort of further escalation between Israel and Iran. But that's not to say that there won't be at some point. Iran coming out and saying that the attacks or that the, uh, the strike uh, by Israel on some of its uh, areas was negligible, caused no damage, poop, 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 not a big deal. And other people saying, actually, it came without them tra uh, looking at it, without them finding it, it sent a really strong message. It sent a really strong message. What Iran is trying to do, especially to the domestic media consumption, is say, this wasn't a big deal because they don't want to retaliate. That is why this chapter is over and there's calm. But you have to think about potentially the geopol geopolitical risk for the future, which is where you can see maybe 5 or $10 spike higher, what Goldman Sachs is saying, if we get that resurgence. At the moment, we're softer again. We're down a half of 1%, 86, 83 on Brent crude. Under surveillance this morning, our top stories. Max 7 earnings kicking off this week. Tesla reporting after the market closed tomorrow. We'll also hear from Meta, Alphabet and Microsoft this week. Amazon and Apple reporting next week. NVIDIA, as you know, always at the tail end. Coming on May 22nd, Tesla, Bramo. What a brutal start to this year for G Tesla. Given the fact that they haven't been able to perform as well as they uh, expected, in China in particular, their market share dropped dropping to below 7% from north of 10% in terms of market share in the Chinese market. The price cuts that we heard reported over the weekend, which actually uh, were, uh, I think, the fourth or the fifth consecutive price cuts. I've lost count. I've lost count. And at this point, how do they get profit margins at a time when they're looking a little bit more like a car company? Down in the pre-market by another... 3%. Elsewhere, the U.S. House of Representatives passing a $95 billion aid package for Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan. The Senate expected to take up the measure as soon as tomorrow. U.S. lawmakers also attaching the Banal Divest Bill for TikTok, setting it to become law in the coming days. Now, talk about losing count of what's happening with Tesla. I mean, I've been losing count following this. How many bills have been put through just as one bill in this Senate? Oh, there was at least four bills, but it's going over to the Senate as one foreign aid package um, that totals almost $100 billion. But if you look at the vote count on whether it was Israel, Taiwan or um, Ukraine, you can see what parts of the uh, representatives, what they're more interested in, especially Republicans. There was more of a vote count on nay when it comes to Ukraine than, say, likes of Taiwan. But TikTok, this could be a make or break moment for TikTok. We've had a CFIUS review still undergoing as far as I'm concerned. And there's also been a number of times that you've seen lawmakers try to ban this company. And now it's becoming this moment where, as Terry Haynes says, by the end of the year, this could be a closed chapter before the legal issue. You say make or break. Exactly. I think Bramo now did about 15 minutes ago. There's a one year window to address some of this, as you've just mentioned. This can get tangled up in the courts and this will be another case of a Chinese company using the Western system against a Western government because that's exactly what most people assume is going to happen. And I wonder what the, what the uh, signal is from the general counsel stepping down, who was the person who is dealing with the U.S. government for TikTok. 
Uh, it just raises a lot of questions in terms of are they going to take a new strategy akin to what you laid out in terms of using the American system against itself. But that signal to me was really important. It meant that he didn't do his job correctly. If this is the place Congress has arrived at, which means at some point something will have to happen with TikTok. Could they have lobbied any harder on a capital? I mean, could they? I mean, honestly, what we heard last week, everybody wants to hate China, and that basically this administration's argument to China is it could be a lot worse, so work with us, even as we basically uh, rake you over the coals. And that's the latest in the nation's capital. Elsewhere, another read on inflation to round out the week. The Fed's preferred gauge, PCE deflator, coming a little bit later this week. Bloomberg survey expecting core PCE to call slightly year over year to 2.7%. Meanwhile, the US two-year yield hovering near 5% ahead of a trio of auctions and the Fed decision just next week. Tasnim Gilwadwala following the impact of those and more as City Commercial Bank. And Tasnim, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more. Tasnim, wonderful to catch up with you. I can just say a little bit about our travels. We've just got back to New York from Washington, D.C. We spent a week, we thought we were going to spend a week at least, talking about the economy. And what we met was a load of economists who were national security experts. Now, Tasnim, I just wonder from your perspective whether you can speak to some of the trends that you've seen evolve that might speak to that, the worries over what's happening between China and the U.S., the U.S. and maybe other countries too. Yes, of course. Thank you, Fuzzly. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so, I mean, definitely we are seeing um, a lot of um, activity with our clients um, as they try to navigate um, the environment, which just seems to be getting more and more intense um, on the macros um, around inflation, around interest rates, um, which are proving to be, you know, definitely higher for longer and, um, you know, clients eagerly awaiting when the cuts are finally going to come. Um, but, you know, as you just mentioned, on the pol political side as well, um, lots of things for our clients to navigate. Tasneem, how much has this actually altered uh, the view for mergers and acquisitions? We were speaking with Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan, and he said it's very difficult for companies to get any conviction to buy another company or merge at a time where a lot of things are being rejected in the name of national security concerns, in the name of antitrust, the name of whatever, you can't predict it. Are you seeing the same thing among your clients? Yeah, it's, it, it is a very, very difficult time on the deal, deal front for companies to, um, you know, go about. Um, although we are seeing um, some deals close, you know, we've had some sell-side um, um, opportunities at City and some of our clients, um, you know, have, have been able to um, go through the cycle. Um, but, you know, l lots of things in the way, um, exactly as you mentioned, and, and also with the high interest rates, um, you know, capital to fund the um, acquisitions are also, you know, an, another factor that is um, proving to be a sticking point for our clients that, you know, it's not cheap anymore um, to buy another company. Um, you've got to, you know, make sure that it's really worth it, that the valuation, um, you're not going to overpay um, and the valuations are going to be there to see you through kind of the medium and the long term. Tasneem, a lot of people are talking about this week as a pivot point. We're going to get the earnings of 178 of the uh, S&P 500 companies. You focus on a whole host of smaller banks and smaller, excuse me, smaller companies uh, that have individual challenges and might have an even better view in terms of the direction of travel of both economic strength and inflation. Are the signs that you're seeing consistent with this general feeling that we're going to get a no landing with inflation that's going to run hot for the foreseeable future? So, I mean, I, I think the one, one of the things that I think is interesting um, that we're seeing with our clients is that they, their balance sheets are actually really, really quite strong um, for, for the vast majority of our clients. Um, we've, you know, been supporting them as they think about diversifying. Um, you know, although the environment is very tough, I think it's also posing quite a lot of opportunities for clients as well. Um, you know, they're, they're really thinking very, very strongly about their supply chains um, and how they um, make them more resilient, how they secure, um, you know, make, make them very, very secure as well. And I think, you know, things like nearshoring, um, things like um, um, diversifying the funding um, environment for our supply chain. I think these are the opportunities that our clients are kind of playing into. Um, so I, I think it's not all doom and gloom, quite frankly, um, where our clients are concerned. Is that nearshoring due to the market or because of policies and, uh, you know, this urge by certain governments? I think it's a bit of both. 
Um, I think, um, you know, on the supply chain side, um, I think clients are trying to address um, things like um, logistic costs, um, like ensuring that, um, you know, their goods actually get there, there's no delays, um, and, and, and manage it from a kind of a cost and a security mode. And then, of course, there's the incentives as well. You know, I, last week I was in Mexico um, where I actually saw this, the whole phenomena of nearshoring, like with my own eyes. It was quite amazing how, you know, um, when large companies, the, the big MNCs, announce either a new investment or an expansion of a factory, like in Mexico, the entire supply chain kind of follows them there and the, and the whole kind of ecosystem gets built out um, around those um, large suppliers like, you know, Kia announcing the big expansion of its plant in Mexico um, for EV cars. Um, there's a whole kind of tier one, tier two, tier three impact um, around the supply chain with that. Do you see Chinese firms moving into Mexico? Because that's been a big concern with lawmakers and officials in the United States. Um, th there are a couple of Chinese firms, but I think it's wider than that. Um, you know, we've seen Korean um, firms as well. We've seen other other Asian um, um, companies moving there as well. So I think it's it's more mixed. I think there's you know what we're noticing um, with um, these these kind of corridors is there's a big um, North Asia to LATAM um, corridor that is very, very vibrant. And it's not only into Mexico as well, it's also into Brazil um, and, and other LATAM countries as well. Tazanin, what it sounds like is for multinationals, it's becoming increasingly complex and it might lead you to believe that perhaps they just stay local and avoid expanding beyond their own borders. You're not seeing that, are you? That's not what I hear. Um, absolutely not. Um, of course, you know, um, companies want to make sure that they're strong, you know, in their domestic and markets and they're operating very well. But I think, you know, the, 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 the vast majority of our clients and the reason they come to City is because they have global ambitions. Um, and so, you know, as they think about how they're going to grow um, themselves and how they're going to succeed in the market, that, you know, more and more our clients are looking at cross-border opportunities as the way in which they are going to grow and, um, and access new markets. And that's where you know, a bank like ours can really help them. Can we just talk about, just finally, how that growth is being funded with interest rates near multi-decade highs in some regions, including here in the United States? Are the sources of funding shifting, Tasnib? Have you noticed that? Um, definitely. So I think one of the first things I'm going to say with, the, with, with such high interest rates for quite some time now um, is that clients are, are really getting um, absolutely focused on their own liquidity and looking at any kind of trapped cash that they may have, looking at very sophisticated, even mid-market clients that, you know, probably didn't pay that much attention as closely to their liquidity as, say, some of the, the very large clients would, 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 would traditionally be doing. Um, they're, they're paying a lot of attention to ensuring that they're, they're efficiently using all the sources of capital, that payments are like SWIFT, um, their, their collections are, are, are really quick as well, and that, that whole cash conversion cycle is, is as tight and as, as efficient as possible. And, um, and, and of course, you know, we, we've got lots of solutions that can help with that. But, uh, but I think um, you know, there's, there's other pools of, of capital, of course, as you know, bank funding, and then we're also seeing the rise of private credit as well um, as, as coming up as being a kind of complementary to bank funding um, for these clients. So lots and lots of kind of innovation happening on the financing side. Has that innovation led to basically an environment where higher rates have not crimped the expansion plans of a lot of these companies? That even though it might be more challenging, you have to be innovative. It's just as uh, available in terms of credit creation to go out and to expand. Yeah, I think so, Lisa. I mean, I, th I think, you know, what we're seeing is that with with companies that are strong they are just getting stronger and and high rates and even you know just general geopolitics don't tend to kind of um um, take the wind out the sails of these types of companies and they do um, use um, almost kind of volatile environments to get even stronger and look for um, opportunities to expand, you know, pick up, sort of do small, we're seeing a lot of mid-market companies like doing not like big transform, transformative um, um, kind of deals, but small bolt-on um, M&A, like, you know, picking up a kind of a $10 million company, $20 million company, you know, adding a particular expertise. You know, those are some of the things that that we're hearing a lot from our clients. Interesting. Tasneem, let's do this again next time you're in New York City. We'd love to have you with us around the table. Tasneem Gia there of City.
breaking down what's happening with some of the lending going to multinational companies, Bramo. And we've said it a few times. Would you stay local given the complexities abroad right now? Not what you heard, just there. And not what you heard from the IMF where they found that uh, global trade is just as robust, it's just as perhaps different places. Also, what we're hearing is, is this a restricted, a sufficiently restrictive interest rate environment? Um, I don't know. It doesn't sound like it based on the fact that companies can keep on borrowing and keep on transacting just in more creative ways. Based on that, they're not being held back. Equity futures on the S&P 500. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Positive here by 0.5%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Donald Trump spent $4.9 million on legal fees in March and has just $6.8 million left in the accounts he's been using to fund his lawyers. That, according to filings, Trump returns to court later today. Classes at Columbia University will be virtual today after reports of anti-Semitic statements and actions on campus. Anti-Semitism at the pro-Palestinian rally is drawing backlash from members of Congress and the White House. Columbia's president said leaders would meet today to discuss a way to end the crisis. Tesla announced price cuts across China, Europe, and the U.S. over the weekend. Now the risk of yet another price war is growing. Li Auto has been the first to respond with discounts and cash rebates on new models in China. Tesla has also slashed the price of its U.S. driver assistance software by a third. And that's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Hey, Danny, thank you. Up next on the program, the strong dollar, here to stay. The point is, if even Japan and Korea are losing ground against the dollar, this is a wave. And my fear is it just goes up from here. We heard a lot of complaints in Washington just last week. We'll talk about them up next on the program. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Bouncing back here on the S&P 500 by zero. 0.5%. Bond yields just a little bit higher of three basis points, 465.18. And the dollar just a touch stronger against the euro, 106.53. Under surveillance this morning, the strong dollar here to stay. The point is, if even Japan and Korea are losing ground against the dollar, this is a wave. And my fear is it just goes up from here. That is not sustainable long term. And then if you're busy having been annoying to all your allies and putting tariffs on them, it's a little hard to then say, oh, please do something cooperatively to bring down the dollar. Here's the latest this morning. Investors gearing up for a busy week of Treasury auctions ahead of key inflation data this week. Over $180 billion in two, five and seven year notes ahead of the PCE deflator due on Friday. Asselineos of RBC writing this. The election is getting closer, but views are still mixed on what it could mean for the US dollar. Most investors expect a Trump victory would be dollar positive. As long as the dollar runs a private sector surplus, we think it's hard for budget deficits to turn into a dollar story. As for I'm pleased to say, it's with us around a table here in New York. How's it good morning to you. Morning. Let's talk about the strength of the US dollar and something that's come up in your note recently that I think is worthy of a longer conversation. Are we beginning to have the 2025 debate around interest rates and not just the 2024 debate? Not quite yet, because I think if we were, we might be looking forward to a little bit more of an impact on high rates on the US economy, because there's very few signs of that so far. And it's that which will ultimately turn the dollar around. Until that happens, until you see signs that the economy is really weakening and that the Fed has to respond, it's very difficult to change the current momentum. Have you got a date on your calendar when you think we might start having that conversation? Well, it's obviously been premature so far, hasn't it? Um, I think there were a lot of calls last year, a lot of people expecting the US to hit recession by now, and clearly here we are. You haven't really changed your view on the dollar and you actually see weakness ahead. How do you push against what we've seen, basically, which is a one-way freight train of dollar strength on the heels of better than expected economic data, hotter than expected inflation data, and frankly, even Fed officials who are changing their communication? So I think the important thing is over what time horizon and to what extent. You know. My year-end call for euro dollar is 108, so obviously higher than where we are today. But that's a call I've had since September of last year, when I think the whole world was looking for 115 to 120. It's more about where we are in terms of the range. For me, the range 106, 110, maybe we go a little bit below. But as we get down there, I do think there's good interest on the part of European hedges to buy and lock in euro dollar at current levels. And that kind of naturally limits the decline. What's the trigger here? Because right now it seems like the data is coming out much weaker in Europe uh, mm -hmm. on a whole host of different metrics, including inflation. Uh, and then what you end up seeing is this feeling that the U.S. 
might not be able to cut rates until December at the earliest. So what's the trigger to really get to those levels that you were expecting last September? Yeah. So I think the interesting thing is that even though we've effectively repriced the Fed, you know, think where we were at the start of the year and how many cuts people were calling for. And, you know, back then, I think we spoke in January, we were very much not in that camp. You know, we were looking for the dollar to outperform on the back of a repricing of the Fed. But given where we are now and given how we're still pricing in a lot of easing for the ECB, it's interesting that we've only been able to get down to a 106 handle. And I think that in itself is telling. You know, the real repricing of rates in the US versus Europe, and yet we're just you know, three to four big figures lower. We started this segment with John quoting some of your note. You say most investors expect a Trump victory would be dollar positive. What would a Biden second term then mean in relationship to the dollar? So I think a lot of people expect a Biden or a Trump victory to be fiscally supportive. You know, the, the reality is that it's hard to picture any political party at the moment in the U.S. delivering fiscal tightening and, and a lot less if you have a divided Congress. But from the point of view of a Biden um, second term, you know, it's a known quantity for a lot of investors. A Trump victory is interesting because there are actually split views. You know, I wrote that note a couple of weeks ago before being on the road for two weeks, and that's definitely the view in Europe. Interestingly, in North America, I found a lot more people willing to contemplate Trump being dollar negative. Why so? So two main parts to it. One is the pressure he may exert on the Fed to be a lot more dovish. And the second is that twin deficit story that I referred to in my note. You know, a lot of people keep coming back to this idea that at some point it's going to turn into a big dollar downward story. When you say Trump dovish on the Fed, doesn't that actually match up with what potentially we might see from the Fed if they hold off on cuts this year? It'll have to be a 2025 story. Will it, though? You know, it depends how much we're getting in the way of fiscal support um, from the government. So you have to expect at some point that the Fed is going to be cutting rates. You know, it's impossible to believe they're going to hold rates at these levels forever. But the timing question is, is a big one because everybody was looking for the cuts to come this year, or a lot of people were looking for that. And, and here we are, right? So yes, it does seem more likely to come in 25, but the question is to what extent? What do you think explains the US-European distinction? You mentioned two very different perspectives, one European, one US. What do you think explains that? I think a lot of that might be the fear within Europe on the part of, you know, what tariffs mean for Europe, what tariffs mean for trade with the US. Uh, and also there's a bias. I mean, as you know, John, in the UK, we always tend to think of a downward trajectory for the pound. Of course, always. It's sort of a permanent mindset. Also, I think what you said, though, sort of brought back memories of a conversation we had with Neil Kashkari around this table of the Minneapolis Fed when we said, is this market worried about the US deficit? And he pointed to the FX market as a reason to say, nothing to see here, no worries at all. If we were worried about the deficit, we'd be selling the US dollar. You said there's a decent chance that maybe that story might change in the next 12 months. It's hard to imagine in the next 12 months, because for me, it all comes down to sector financial balances and in particular what the private sector is doing. As things stand, a good chunk of the U US budget deficit is financed domestically. And as long as that's the case, you're not relying as much of the kindness of foreigners to plug that gap. That said, and this I thought was fascinating, Seth Carpenter over at Morgan Stanley over the weekend, he came out and said, uh, basically, the stock of government debt is still repricing to the generally higher level of nominal rates after a decade of low negative rates. This was in reference to developed market sovereign debt. That repricing will lead to an inflection point where debt servicing costs start to accelerate. Doesn't that worry you if 2025 is not a story of cuts like so many people expect? At some point, that will very much matter. You know, debt trajectory can be absolutely worrying. But at the same time, you've got to bear in mind that we've been here, so, you know, we've, we've had this conversation around Japan so many times before, right? And, and it never plays out. And why does it not play out? Because actually, you're in an environment where domestic investors are very willing to finance it at the right yield. And at some point, the economy does slow down and the Fed cuts rates. Domestic investors meaning the Bank of Japan. <laughs> That's what I think. I'm just saying, <laughs> theoretically. Also, this was great. Thanks for being with us. Asselin Yosser of RBC Capital Markets breaking down the dollar story. Dolly M right now, 154.76. Lots of talk, conversation expected about supply this week. Lisa's been through the numbers already. Worth going through them again. $30 billion of two-year notes coming tomorrow. After that, $70 billion of five-year notes. And following that, we'll get $44 billion of seven-year notes. So a lot through the front end and into the belly of the curve. Coming up next in the second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, we'll catch up with Bob Michael.
of JP Morgan Asset Management. We'll speak to Bloomberg's Jack Fitzpatrick and Alex Webb. And we'll catch up with Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence with some big tech earnings on deck. Equity futures on the S&P 500. We are positive here by half of 1%. Live from New York City, kicking off a brand new trading week. This is Bloomberg. the tepid 20s, and we're more in the roaring 20s camp. We have growth, yes, slower growth, but growth overall. People are concerned that we're not going to see the growth expectations that maybe were anticipated. So there's a lot of pressure on a handful of stocks. Top line should hold in there given the strong economy above trend growth. I don't think it's going to turn out to be the tepid 20s. I still think the most likely scenario is actually the roaring 2020s. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Last week was a weird week. Market participants seemed more constructive about the economy and financial markets than policymakers did, usually the other way around. Yeah, well, and who gets it right? That's my question. Well, that's how a different often, question. How often is it a counterindicator when we hear you know, gloom and doom from some of the uh, policymakers? Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning to you all. Your trading week begins right now. Equity futures positive by 0.5%. Let's go straight to the calendar again and talk about tech earnings this week. Big four. It's Tesla first, out of the gate tomorrow, then on to Meta on Wednesday, then Microsoft and Google on Thursday, then Bramo, it's into next week, Amazon, Apple, and into May, NVIDIA. And frankly, it comes at a really important inflection point, and we've been hearing this time and time again. Basically, you've seen losses, the biggest weekly loss for the MAG7 going back to November of 2022 at a time where maybe, just maybe, the AI adoption isn't happening as quickly and in as robust a manner as many people had expected. The pain is real. We had a 10% move on NVIDIA on Friday. We've had a 40% move lower year-to-date for Tesla. Tesla in focus, I think, for so many of you at home. AMH, another round of price cuts going into the earnings release tomorrow after the bout. As well as on the heels of layoffs. And I was just looking at Dan Ives' note he put out before this earnings. He said it's a moment of truth arrived for Elon Musk. And he's basically saying if Musk is flippant again on the call and there's no adult in the room with no answers, darker days will be ahead for this company. All right, so I want to see if he comes out and doesn't have that. Dan Ives, is he going to come in in a suit? In a, in a black suit? Hey, he promised, with his right? He promised. Is he going to get bear, a bullet bearish on this name? Is he going to not say... Buy anymore? Let's see. It's been the moment of truth for a while for that name. <laughs> Correct. And Dan Ives over at Wedbush. That stock, that name is down about 3% in the pre-market right now. Great guest alongside us. So let's get straight to the price action. Equity futures on the S&P 500, just about positive by 0.5%. In the bond market, the scores look like this. Beginning with a 10-year Treasury yield, higher by three or four basis points now, approaching 470 all over again at 465.79. Lisa, you mentioned it in the previous hour. No Fed speak. Quiet period. Fed decision next week. What did we learn last week from Fed officials? Frankly, the fact that John Williams of the New York Fed came out and talked about the potential of even hiking rates, if the data warranted it, was a massive shift. You know, honestly, over the weekend, again, there was so much focus on communication failures by this Federal Reserve. And I need to shift the paradigm, maybe come up with some sort of scenario analysis as a way to give people a sense of how they would respond to specific developments as a way to better communicate to markets what they foresee. Two year, really close to 5% at the moment, 499.71. Coming up this hour, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management ahead of inflation data later on this week. We'll catch up with Bloomberg's Alex Webb as Tesla delivers another round of price cuts and Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence previewing Max 7 earnings. We begin with our top story, nowhere to hide. Stocks on a six day losing streak and bond yields climbing towards the highs of the year. Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management writes in this, we are hoping there is a further washout of markets into month end. It's been overdue and would allow an opportunity for money to come in from the sidelines. Bob is on the sidelines of the show right now. Bob, good morning to you. Happy to be here. Hey, it's good to see you and good to catch up. Lisa said it. Fed officials wondering out loud, are we restrictive enough? Do you think they are? Yeah, I think the narrative, how it's moved to rate hikes is interesting to me, because if that's true, you're effectively setting a new indoor record for Fed policy. You go back and say, if they hike rates again, they will never have cut rates. So what's the longest distance of time from one rate hike to another? We know what that is. It was 2015 to 2016. It was 12 months. 
I don't think any of us are calling for a rate hike in July. So if they hike any time after July, then it's another new record for distance of time from one rate hike to another. It seems implausible. And then I go back to something else. We look at the summary of economic projections, the nefarious dot plot, the highest dot ever for neutral policy, the median was four and a quarter percent. And then if you get to the extremes, it was four and a half percent. That's 2012. So over the last 12 years, no one on the Fed has ever believed that rates had to be higher than four and a quarter, maybe four and a half percent as a long-term neutral rate. And here we are, five and a quarter, five and a half percent. I put those things together. I can't really believe that we're going to see anything approaching a rate hike over the next year. You've been constructive and constructive for a while. Last time you sat in that chair, I think you said, this is the most bullish we've been since the mid 2000s. Is that still the case? Yeah, very much so. The, the more we look at this, the more we see this playing out like 1995, which is the one soft landing anybody could have lived through and worked through. And I remember that like it was yesterday because the first quarter of 95, everyone only saw demons. You had U.S. Steel default, you had the tequila crisis, you had um, Orange County default, you, you had problems uh, with the securitized markets. I think at that point, GE had bought Kidder and, and was uh, solving for that by liquidating it. So lots of problems. Nonetheless, we had a soft landing. The Fed came in in July and started cutting rates. They, they did 75 basis point in rate cuts, and then they took 25 of that back a year later. The markets did great from 95 to 98. And by the way, inflation two and a half to three percent during that period. So you can live with slightly higher inflation and a slightly higher Fed funds rate. So you think the Fed's still going to cut three times this year? Not so much today. I don't okay. think that. So, so, Not so, much so how today. much would they have to cut to continue to feel bullish and the most optimistic that you felt going back two decades? So here's what I struggle. I gave the very elaborate narrative on how rate hikes can't be possible because it would be a new record. If they came back and cut at year end, that's another new record. So no matter what they do, they're going to set a record because the longest distance of time from last hike to first cut was 2006, seven in there, it was 15 months. So you're, you're looking at a record one way or another, so we're in uncharted space. I, I think the Fed wants to take the edge off of things. There are still frailties out there. You've had a 525 basis point rate hike. It's created a vulnerability in the system. You're seeing it in the consumer through housing. Housing affordability is the lowest on record. You're seeing it in the ongoing reconsolidation of the commercial property market with office buildings. They're trading at 60 to 80% below their original appraisal. And you're looking at CNI loans, you're looking at businesses that are funding themselves at 11, 12%, and a few years ago were funding themselves at 5%. So that weakness is there. I think it's slowing things down. It's slowing things down a lot more slowly than we anticipated, but I think we'll get there towards year end. Just to give you a sense of how much conviction you have, how aggressively are you buying right now as we do get the sell-off in bonds? So I'm trying to hang on to all my fingers and toes and keep my discipline into month end. This feels like a real month end washout. Somewhere around this time in the month when you have those, the third week, you get a little bit of buying and then everyone gives up the ghost into month end. So I'm gonna wait and see what happens going into Friday and Monday. There's some big data coming out. You not only have PCE, you have the Bank of Japan. I think you also still have a, a lot of investors wanting to take profits or a lot of momentum investors yet to cash out. So we're really close. We're really looking at levels both in government bonds, more importantly in credit, and we feel this is a pretty good opportunity to get in. That's our next question. The washout where? You're looking for it more in credit than you are in treasuries? I'm hoping for it in credit. I'm hoping that we can push high yield back to 400 basis points over. I think that's too far. Can we get to like 350, 360? <clears throat> Absolutely, I'm a buyer in there. 
corporate credit, we've already started to buy uh, because it, it's mostly the risk-free rate in there, and that's had a pretty good backup. And, and treasuries, yeah, we'll see how this next round of fundings go, and we'll be in there buying. Are you worried about the auctions at all? We'll talk about that a little bit more a little bit later. Lisa's been talking about the numbers, some record issuance on some maturities. Any concerns there whatsoever? No, not at all. So not why wouldn't you be buying now? What are you waiting for? I think, so I'm not concerned about the auctions from a longer term structural um, budget deficit fiscal policy because I think it does get spent, it, it gets used in the economy and it generates revenue um, which the treasury collects. So that doesn't bother me and I think we've shown that it's sustainable and the entire yield curve is, is trading below Fed funds. I, I think this is a month where People just want to get out of the way and see what happens. I want to see where things settle. There, there's no advantage to buying the day before three big auctions instead of the day after. You know, I was struck by a Bank of America credit investor survey that came out in the past couple of days, and they said that the investors' number one concern was inflation. You don't seem as concerned about inflation. The number two biggest concern was central bank policy error at a time where some people are saying that the policy error already happened at the end of last year with the initial pivot into talking about rate cuts. What do you think the biggest potential central bank policy error could be through the remainder of this year? That they do anything? That maybe they should just sit on their hands and see how things play out? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think there's nothing they can do wrong at this point in time other than hike rates or be too hawkish. I don't know that the pivot in December changed things from what we're seeing. Corporate profitability looks good. The consumer looks pretty stable. In inflation hasn't moderated at the rate we've wanted, but you know what? It's less than half of where it was a couple years ago. I think we're in a pretty good spot, and I can understand why the Fed wants to wait for a couple more quarters and see how things play out. Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management. Bob, you're going to be sticking with us, I'm pleased to say. If you are just joining us, the two-year at the moment, basically a 5%, 4.99. Very briefly, with a five handle earlier this morning on a 10-year up by three or four basis points, 4.66. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Israel's military intelligence chief has resigned, citing security failures that led to the October 7th attack carried out by Hamas terrorists. The IDF confirms that its head of the military intelligence, Ahran Haliva, has stepped down after two and a half years in the role. Haliva said, quote, the intelligence division under my command did not live up to the task that we were entrusted with. Protests have been growing in Israel in, Israel in the recent weeks, calling for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his cabinet to take responsibility for the attacks and resign. TSMC options traders are preparing for a continued route. Put volume on U.S. ADRs climbed to the highest since January. Shares have fallen over the past six sessions, erasing over $100 billion in market value. An NVIDIA option put options also surged to its highest since 2017 on Friday. Los Angeles Dodgers star Shohei Otani broke the record for the most home runs by a Japanese-born MLB player. Otani's home run in Sunday's win over the New York Mets was his 176th in his seventh season in the league. And we should have plenty more opportunities to extend his record. Itani is still in the first year of a 10-year, $700 million deal with the Dodgers. And that's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Crazy numbers. Danny, thank you. Up next on the program, the foreign aid bill heads to the Senate. Well, the aid package certainly passes on TikTok. Uh, you know, I, I don't think, honestly, we know yet. We'll have that conversation next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Stocks are positive, negative every single day last week. We're bouncing back by a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields are pushing higher again. 466 on a 10-year, the two-year essentially at 5%, up a single basis point on the session this morning. Under surveillance, the foreign aid bill heading to the Senate. The aid package certainly passes. Uh, Ukraine, Israel, the Indo-Pacific, read Taiwan. Uh, there's an also an awful lot of sanctions uh, 
and, uh, and foreign policy matters that pass on TikTok, my instinct is that the, uh, you know, the wave kind of washes over the people who want that more nuanced approach uh, and we get right into the full ban. Uh, but that's very much a live ball in the Senate. Here's the latest. A Senate vote expected tomorrow on $95 billion in foreign aid for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan after the bill cleared the House. The House also passing a bill that would force Chinese-controlled bike dance to divest from TikTok or face a ban in the United States. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Jack Fitzpatrick. Jack, let's talk about what you're looking for this week. Uh, there's this one big thing in the Senate. They, all four of those measures that the House passed were actually packaged together. So there's one bill that the Senate has to work on. The Senate wasn't even supposed to be in town this week, but they're staying for one major passage vote. Uh, it's not entirely clear how much it can be slowed down, but there were some procedural man maneuvers to make sure this isn't going to take too long. The first vote happens tomorrow. Uh, the second vote that actually passes all of these measures, assuming they do pass it, could be late tomorrow, might stretch into Wednesday. Uh, but one major thing on the to-do list in the Senate for all the foreign aid money, as well as the TikTok uh, measure and the sanctions that are all packaged into one measure in the Senate. $100 billion worth, nearly, Jack, when you look at all of this. So what kind of hurdles can we see? What do you think it will be? Will it be on some of the provisions like sanctions or TikTok, or actually on some of that money, that aid that's going to Taiwan, Israel, and Ukraine? I mean, it's a matter of politics now because all the, the all the provisions passed with more than 300 votes in the House. Uh, if there were a holdup, you know, the closest vote was on Ukraine aid, but the Senate has already passed a separate Ukraine aid measure that didn't make it through the House. So it does appear to have a glide path in terms of the legislation becoming law. Uh, the questions that remain are, what does that mean for Mike Johnson? Uh, what does that mean for a potential motion to vacate the chair? But also, wh what position does it put Republicans in heading toward the election? Uh, the, the political questions questions are where there's more uncertainty around where Republicans stand and where they're going in the future with regard to foreign aid. But this this particular package looks very, very strong going into the Senate. OK, so let's talk about some of the politics involved. Could you see a future where Hakeem Jeffries comes to the defense of Speaker Johnson? I don't think Hakeem Jeffries himself has to, but he has said that there are a significant number of Democrats who don't want to see the speaker lose his position over Ukraine aid. Now, they don't even have to vote for Johnson if there's a motion to vacate. They could decline to cast a vote, which would then lower the threshold that Johnson needs in terms of the number of Republican votes uh, to stay in power. Uh, it, it inevitably would be probably a fairly close vote, but there are a number of centrist Democrats who uh, ha have made it clear they're not interested in a speaker getting kicked out for allowing a bipartisan vote on the Ukraine measure, even if Democratic leadership doesn't really want their fingerprints all over that. And Jack, taking a step back, a lot of people are looking for what the signal is from this vote. The idea that a lot of people, particularly uh, on the far right, were pretty much hardliners when it came to additional spending. And now you have the, the potential passage, is maybe through the Senate, of additional aid to Ukraine, additional aid to Israel, and as well as this TikTok bill. Elsa Linos of RBC Capital earlier was saying, whoever wins the election in November is going to be fiscally supportive. Does this represent a willingness by Congress to back that fiscally supportive type of feeling from either of the candidates who are running for president? I think there are a lot of variables still that go into that. So it might be a little, I mean, first of all, there's not going to be massive legislating and massive changes of direction in, in fiscal policy because Congress struggles to do big, big things. There are still questions about uh, the degree to which the tax cuts from 2017 are extended when they come up in 2025. Uh, there is a debt limit deadline. Technically, uh, it's the suspension lifts in January. 
January, but the extraordinary measures can bump that back. If Republicans still have a foothold in either chamber of Congress and Biden wins re-election, they would want to take a pretty fiscally conservative approach. They probably wouldn't if Trump wins. Uh, there are a lot of variables there. This doesn't necessarily show a willingness to spend a ton of money. I would point out most House Republicans voted against the Ukraine aid measure, which is part of why it's politically dicey for Johnson. So there, there are a lot of uh, a lot of questions still unanswered about what the next Congress would look like after the election in terms of fiscal policy. And I'm not sure we can learn that much from this one, which was a bipartisan coalition action rather than a clear message of policy, especially from Republicans. Whoever wins, I'm sure we're going to have a ton of fun in 25. Jack, thank you, sir. Jack Fitzpatrick there in Washington, D.C. Bob Michael with us in New York for some final thoughts. Bob, how do you explain how uncomfortable policymakers are with geopolitics and how seemingly comfortable market participants are with geopolitics? How do you explain the difference? Because we've lived with geopolitics for a long time now. Unfortunately, we're in the third year of Russia, Ukraine. You learn to put it to the side. There's the initial shock. And, and these are the markets. They're dispassionate. They try to move on, process the data. And the data is, is glaring. It's right there. Corporate profitability looks good. Our analysts talk to businesses. They're talking about a pickup over the next year. You look at household. Yeah, they put more on their credit cards, but they're fully employed and they've got positive real wages. Those are the positive things in the market. And then there's a lot of cash on the side. You've got $6 trillion in money market funds. And I'm going to tell you why you never have to look at the senior loan officer survey again. Please. If you look at CNI loans. I enjoyed loans, how you looked at Bramah yeah. when you said that. I know where this is going to go. <laughs> if, Carry on. Please. Excuse me. Lisa. Uh, yes. If you look at, at the book Bob? of business yes. for CNI loans in the U.S., it's either side of $3 trillion. It's some estimates of 2.8, some of 3.1. What's the size of private credit? $1.7 trillion. There's a non-bank lender out there. So while the bank's senior loan officer surveys were showing a tightening in credit conditions, something almost two-thirds the size of the banking system was looking for every opportunity to extend credit into the system. That market is still there. There's still a lot of cash going into it. That's a pretty nice tailwind to the economy. As someone once said, OK, let's rip up the script. Going back to your thesis to buy bonds, all of this speaks to a no landing scenario. If you don't have something that's particularly restrictive, if you have credit that's easily available, if you have fiscal spending that's continuing to support certain aspects of the environment, of the economy, why is inflation going to come lower in a fully employed United States where people are spending on Tide Pods at a, at a pretty uh, escalating pace? We've landed. We've come from very high levels of unemployment. We came from some sort of, you know, double digit growth in, in um, you know, 2021 down to something that's in the, you know, two, two and a half percent real. You've got inflation that's not seven, nine or 10 percent. You're looking at two and a half to three, maybe three and a half. So we've already landed from that very high level of, of growth and inflation that we were. What we're talking about is 95, where you start to grow at trend and inflation may be a little bit above the 2% the central bank wants, but I don't think enough to worry the markets. My takeaway, I just want to make sure I'm taking away the right message from you, because I'll repeat this for the rest of the week. You think this is a stable equilibrium where we are right now, where inflation is growth, where rates are? I think for now it is. I do think, I go back to one of my original comments, which we, we never saw anyone on the Fed in the last 12 years throw out five plus percent as the long-term neutral. So it's restri restrictive, it's slowing things down. At some point they're gonna have to come in like they did in 95 and take rates down a little bit, maybe 50, 75 basis points to take the edge off of businesses and households. But it looks like it's a really good environment. You think the long dot, and I've only got 30 seconds, might have a four handle once all is said and done? I think over time, we'll go back to a four handle because there's a new demographic and look at 
the millennials and either side of that. They're now in their 30s. They're the dominant earner, spender, saver. Fascinating. Bob, this was great. It's good to see you. Always a pleasure. Thank to be you, here. sir. Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management, and not a word on Liverpool Football Club. That was like the, the appearance fee, we <laughs> promised. Coming up, Tesla shares on track for their seventh day of losses after delivering another round of price cuts. We're down by 3.6%. Bloomberg's Alex Webb, up next. Closing below 5K on the S&P 500 for the first time since February. Equity futures attempting to bounce back by 0.5%. It's quite a run of losses on the S&P 500, coming off the back of its worst week all the way back to the bank intention of spring of last year. The run of losses is six consecutive days. That's the longest losing streak. It equals it, going all the way back to October 2022. The Nasdaq up by 0.6%. The Russell, the small caps up by 0.5%. The focus, I think, for us, Bramo, this week has got to be the Nasdaq 100, given the weightings of these big tech names. Given the fact that this is kind of the moment of truth, if you want to use uh, Dan Ives' words, about whether they can deliver the earnings that can maybe prove a buying the dip type of moment. I think that Lori Calvacino really nailed it over the weekend. She said investor sentiment has taken a bit of a hit, but it's too early to say the pullback is over. Everyone said buy the dip. Unclear whether the dip has happened yet, if this is the dip or if the dip is more to come. We just heard from a big bull. Yes. You know, like he was talking about being the big, big, biggest bull all the way going back, what, 20 years? Uh huh. OK, most bullish he's been since the mid 2000s, mid 90s. What did he say? There's a washout here. Wait. What's the wait a few extra weeks? Exactly. So basically someone who's bullish is still not buying at these levels because sure. they're waiting to have more uh, data come in to confirm that. What's that data going to be? It's going to be earnings. It's going to be PCE. And it's going to be what happens at the Oz auctions and whether yields can keep on climbing. And a Fed decision next Wednesday as well. Let's turn to the bond market. The two-year through 5% once again, a little bit earlier this morning. On a two-year right now, up a single basis point to 4.9993. On a 10-year up by three or four basis points to 4.6579. The last week has been a mix of solid data, jobless claims again, in at around 200K. And Fed officials starting to say the quiet part out loud. Perhaps we aren't restrictive enough. And maybe if the data warrants it, they're going to have to hike rates further. This led some, including Ben Bernanke, the former Fed chair, coming out over the past couple of weeks and saying they need to change their communication strategy. He talked about maybe you need scenario analysis. The dots are kind of useless. A lot of people feel that the dots are just basically a nice design and that what they should be doing is talking about if we see inflation come up to this level, this is how we'll respond, rather than just sort of this, I don't know, let's see, we've got more data coming in. Let's look at at, you know, the sleuths. Let's look at, I don't know. Or not, apparently. Or jolts. Yeah, I actually can never look at them again, evidently. Yeah. Ben Bernanke, do you find that curious that the Bank of England turned to Bernanke to come up with a new communication regime when he was the one who, I wouldn't say was solely responsible. He had some help on the FOMC. Janet Yellen helped him too. Responsible for leading this communication regime coming out of the great financial crisis. I can't really wrap my head around it. I mean, it's a lot to sort of digest. Why does we turn to Bernanke yeah, I mean, for, I, yeah, odd. Maybe if he well, thinks I think it's because Yellen's tied up. I think she, maybe she was the first We would have choice. turned to Yellen. OK. <laughs> That's where we are right now. That's the bond market. Let's talk about foreign exchange. This from Kit Jukes of Sokgen. A pause to reflect or maybe just to confuse us all. I'm with you, Kit. This is what Kit has to say on the euro. Our forecasts look for a fall below 105, but not to parity, which is hardly thrilling. So I'm hoping for surprises rather than expecting them. Because at the moment, Europe is just doing exactly what everyone expects it to do, which is not a great deal of things. And we're stuck between 106 and 107 at 106.39. What Elsa Lino said I thought was fascinating. The fact that we're not closer to parity tells you a lot because what you've seen is, yeah, Europe doing Europe, right? But the U.S. doing U.S. and better than the U.S. has done it in the past. Basically, we're looking at the potential for uh, no cuts this year. So why didn't we see a bigger move? And the fact that we have it makes her think, OK, maybe this is stability, the sort of equilibrium that we were just talking about. Europe going to Europe. Is that right? Is that the title of today's newsletter? Europe going to Europe. <laughs> it's been a really confusing bunch of weeks. Can I just tell you, I think a lot of people are just like, you know, give us some conviction. Yeah. We got to sit here. I mean, look, even if you've got conviction, you're bullish. You're not buying. That's the, that's the tone of the morning. The euro going to euro with negative 0.1%, 106 39. You've offended a lot of people, Bramo. No, I Under haven't. Under surveillance this morning, you haven't. Israel's <laughs> military intelligence chief resigning over the failure to prevent the October 7th invasion by Hamas. It comes amid growing protests in Israel calling on Benjamin Netanyahu's government to take responsibility 
for the events in early October. Actually, over the weekend, MH, can we just say, you know, some quiet, no real big developments like we had in a previous week? Absolutely. In terms of a calm at the moment, the end of this chapter we've seen potentially between Iran and Israel. But I will just say the Israeli people have been starving for some sort of re recognition by the government that they were at fault for what happened on October 7th. And you're seeing it now with this resignation. Will the call stop for Netanyahu? to step down, I'm not sure. You're seeing protests of tens of thousands of people that just haven't abated since that attack. Brent crude right now, negative 0.6%, 86.76 on Brent. Elsewhere, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo saying Huawei's latest phone shows China trails the US in chip technology. In an interview with 60 Minutes on CBS, Raimondo saying this, we have the most sophisticated semiconductors in the world. China doesn't. We've out-innovated China. But then Leslie Stahl says, when, well, we, you mean Taiwan. And then Gina Raimondo goes, fair. Because, yeah, the United States designs them, but 90% are made in Taiwan. You remember that trip last summer, Raimondo going to China, and Huawei unveiled that phone. Is this the snapback? Is that what this is? Well, not just unveiled that phone. What else did they do? They were spying on her. Remember, there was these leaks that they were getting into Secretary Gina Raimondo's emails. And she kind of took it as, well, they know my work here is important. Are we surprised by that? Would you just expect to be spied on as a foreign leader landing in China? Wouldn't you expect that? I'll give you an anecdote. I spoke with an executive who went there, who serves on different boards, who said that they use a burner phone and a burner laptop, and that's pretty much what everybody does when they go there because they know they're going to be spied on. It's basically protocol if you're an executive of any type when you go to China, which is incredibly surprising that she'd make herself vulnerable to that, given the fact that people do not bring their cell phones to China because of just that. Yep, interesting exchange with the Commerce Secretary overnight. Let's pick it up on shares of Tesla falling in the pre-market after the automaker cut prices on a range of models in the US, Europe and China. The move potentially sparking a new price war in China with one automaker there already slashing prices on its models in response. It caps a busy few days for Tesla ahead of its earnings report tomorrow. The company also recently announcing it will reduce headcount by more than 10% globally. Bloomberg's Alex Webb joins us now for more. Alex, we get earnings tomorrow after the close. I just wonder how low or high this bar is for Elon Musk and co. I think expectations are remarkably low given what we've seen at Tesla um, in recent weeks and but also compared to how high they were perhaps just a year ago. That does mean actually that any surprise to the upside is perhaps likely to be taken positively by the market. We've seen you know, a huge um, increase in the number of uh, uh, sell ratings on the stock. The 12 month target price is very close to, um, to where the stock is right now. So it does mean that actually perhaps the bar isn't terribly high tomorrow. Alex, when these price cuts started in the last year, there was a bullish way to frame this that Tesla had the margins and they could put the squeeze on everybody else as they're trying to ramp up production and gain market share. Can we frame it quite as bullishly now? I mean, it's very hard to do so, given that they have lost four percentage points of market share in that time frame. They're at about 10 percent market share in the first quarter of last year. They're at about six and a bit percent now. The, th the challenge they have is that companies such as BYD, the more scale that they have, the easier it is for them to reach greater economies as a consequence. And that has very much been the BYD approach to get into as many different segments as they possibly can, increase, uh, often at a quite low price point, which then means it's cheaper for them to, of course, produce the vehicles at all. It is an incredibly competitive space in China. And Tesla's timing was pretty inopportune. They expanded production capacity globally to something like 2 million unit, units, just as um, demand for EVs started to decline. And what's more, you started to see the second-hand EVs come into the market. You see the massive price depreciation on those, which is sort of inversely turbocharged demand for in the market. The people see the drop off, they go, oh gosh, do I want to be exposing myself to that? And it makes the, the slowing down of the market even uh, more drastic. So a lot of pessimism around this name, especially as they have lost share in China, as you mentioned. How much could the robo-taxi shift that? It's hard to see how. The, the, the struggle that I see with this uh, vehicle is I'm not sure what the business model is, right? Is this just actually they're going to be selling drive, you know, 
when they talk about full um, self-driving, which is the name of their kind of superior uh, cruise control product that they have, it is not full self-driving. Are they just going to be selling then a new version of self-driving to their customers? Or when they talk about a robo-taxi, are they talking about a new business where you are putting fleets of robo-taxis on the road? If it's the latter, I have no idea what investors are going to make of that or how they'll see the upside of that because it's an incredibly uh, expensive proposition. These vehicles if they, are, if they genuinely are full self-driving, will be costing well in excess of $100,000, one would assume. If you need to get 100,000 of them onto the, street of a city, uh, onto the streets of a city like New York, that's billions and billions of dollars. So I'll be fascinated to see the business case that he makes when this thing comes out. Alex, what about a bet on a lower mass market car? What happened to the $25,000 Tesla that was supposed to be competitive? Well, it certainly looks as though the experience in China has informed that. You know, it, it looks increasingly difficult to compete with the likes of BYD in that geography. Uh, so, but it, you know, if you were a corporate strategist, you might well look at it and go, well, let's not even bother. Let's go for the bit that we really can own, which is the more premium segment where we can get the juicier margins. But even right now, they're struggling a little bit on that front. So it's something that investors had really been hoping for, for that next leg of growth. And for now, it doesn't look like it's going to be coming. Alex, we're all fascinated with the China piece of this and not just with this company, with another company that you follow closely, Apple. They will be reporting next week. Do you see any crossover whatsoever between the struggles that Tesla is having and the struggles that Apple is having in that country? I think there might be one note of... Uh, of comparability in that there is a certain there is a rise in Chinese um, nationalism essentially that they should support their domestic brands that is something that appears to be hitting Apple a bit at the moment that we were talk you were talking about Huawei just a few minutes ago brands like Huawei Xiaomi are experiencing a bit of an uplift in their home market it is the Chinese brands in EVs that are also dominating lots of people saying that maybe the next when they start hitting Europe, that that's when these companies really will reach a scale which will make it very, very hard for anyone to compete with. Any pushback from the Europeans yet, Alex? We just got back from Washington, D.C., and everybody was talking about putting up the walls to Chinese EVs and just waiting for that decision. What's it sound like on the ground over on the continent? It is quite a, t a tense matter. We're going to see a Chinese car maker set up a factory in Italy. As things stand, that is going to happen. There's been a lot of criticism from other parts of the region because of that. But at the same time, if you want to meet your goals when it comes to climate change, you need to have more of these vehicles on the roads. At the moment, it's quite hard to import them from China. So producing them locally, the argument is then at least you're employing people locally. And it's good for the, you know, for the local economy in that sense. So it's clearly not a, a, a an, an issue on which everybody agrees, there, are, there is increasing tension around this theme. Tesla down 30% in just three months. Alex Webb, thank you, sir. Alex Webb there on Tesla, on Apple. Tesla reporting earnings after the close tomorrow, then on to Apple next week. Two big talk stock stories to break down, including that piece on China, just what is happening in the world's second largest economy. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere. We can do that with your Bloomberg brief. Here is Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. The New York Stock Exchange is asking stakeholders on their thoughts about 24-7 trading, according to a report in the FT. The survey reportedly asked respondents whether there should be non-stop trading throughout the entirety of the week and how they would staff any overnight session. Ryzen shares higher in the pre-market trade, up by about 1.5%. It beat on profit. It also had a boost in wireless subscribers, thanks to both price hikes and customers choosing premium plans. The CEO said that they are on track to meet guidance for the year. TikTok's future is looking more uncertain in the U.S. The House is passing a measure, has passed a measure requiring TikTok's owner ByteDance to sell its stake in the social media firm. If it refuses, it might be banned in the U.S. Sources have told Bloomberg that ByteDance intends to fight the effort in court before considering a sale. The Senate is expected to vote on the measure tomorrow. That's your brief. John. Danny, thank you. Lisa nailed it earlier this morning. They're going to drag this out and drag this out. They're going to say that the matter's concluded going into the election and nothing's going to be concluded. Basically, this is how you avoid an issue that could potentially alienate a younger demographic that use TikTok. Yes, we're aware of the concerns. We're on it. We're going to do something, but it won't affect you in any way, shape or form in any time of the foreseeable future. For, so therefore, out of sight, out of mind. Younger demographic for the Democrats, but potentially a key donor for the Republicans. Big focus down in D.C. Up next on the program, earnings season ramping up.
there's a lot of pressure on a handful of stocks. We know that. We'll see the earnings come through on those. But the momentum isn't what's driving us anymore. And I think that's key. Four of the MAG7 reporting earnings this week. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg. Yields up, stocks up, SockGen this morning, no landing, no cuts, they're long copper and gold. Taking a look at crude right now, negative by 0.1%, $83 and about six cents. Yields a bit higher by three or four basis points, 465.59. And equities after closing south of 5K on the S&P 500 in Friday's session, bouncing back by 0.6%. Under surveillance this morning, earnings season ramping up. There's a lot of pressure on a handful of stocks. We know that. We'll see the earnings come through on those. Netflix obviously did better, but guidance was poor. We'll see what happens um, with the rest of the handful of those stocks. But the momentum isn't what's driving us anymore. And I think that's key when we're looking. Low momentum names have actually outperformed high momentum over the last week. Here's the latest. Here's the calendar. Max 7 earnings kicking off this week. Tesla due tomorrow, followed by Meta on Wednesday. Google and Microsoft reporting on Thursday. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us around the table. Mandeep, we've got Amazon and Apple next week. Later on in May, you're going to hear from NVIDIA. If we could give you one release right here, right now, which one would you want? Microsoft. I mean, look, uh, good enough earnings is not going to do this earnings season. You need to have spectacular earnings. NVIDIA has delivered that for the last two times. This time around, it's not going to be, I think, NVIDIA. It will probably be Microsoft because uh, they are the ones who are actually deploying AI. When you think about, you know, what are companies doing all the, with all the GPUs? NVIDIA and Meta have the most GPU allocation, and we know Meta is using it internally. Microsoft is the one that's actually deploying it on the cloud, and that's what you want to see in the numbers. What would you expect to see in the numbers later this week? I mean, the Azure growth, last time around, they quantified it was around four to 500 basis point uh, lift from AI. You want that lift to be higher than what they reported the last time around. There has been a feeling in markets that maybe we got ahead of ourselves when it came to how quickly AI would be adopted and deployed, to your point. Do you expect to see that type of sentiment in Microsoft's earnings, and frankly, even in the likes of Apple's earnings, given the fact that they're trying to deploy it in uh, some very specific ways? Well, so Microsoft is uniquely positioned because one, it's using a lot of its own CapEx to deploy AI, and then it's got consumer facing products, whether it's your co-pilot or you know, just how they are deploying it in search uh, with open AI. I mean, basically what they're saying is, we will be the first ones to deploy open AI, and we also have the capacity with the GPUs for others to deploy. And that's a great value proposition if you think about, you know, investors looking to play that AI team, whereas NVIDIA is more, okay, everyone wants GPUs, they are in short supply, the pricing is high, but then it will normalize, and that's the risk they have. Will this earnings season officially be the obituary on Magnificent Seven, on this concept that we could talk about this cohort in some sort of cohesive way, given the fact that they all face very different outcomes, very different outlooks, and frankly, a very different journey with their stock price? Well, so I put them in two buckets. The consumer facing ones, your Tesla and Apple are the most exposed because one, the device refresh will be slow or your car refresh will be slow. And uh, they don't have that enterprise exposure. I mean, you want to play companies that are exposed to this CapEx wave. Every large tech company right now is investing in CapEx and they are beneficiaries of that CapEx spin. These companies are exposed to consumer and you're not seeing that kind of lift. And, and that's where I, I think they probably will struggle with top line growth. Also, those two companies you pulled out, not just the exposure to the consumer, but also China. What yes. are you expecting in terms of China eating at these earnings? You're absolutely right. I mean, in the case of uh, Apple, it's almost uh, 15 to 20 percent revenue exposure. And, and it's the same for even NVIDIA. They have that kind of exposure where if something goes wrong geopolitically, you're going to lose that revenue stream. And, and that, that right now is a big risk for any large tech company being exposed to China revenue. It, it's a big risk. And the other ones don't have that. Do you think the markets have really taken that on, have really ingrained that in their brain, that if there is a big geopolitical risk, there's massive downside to these companies? Well, so I think some of it is embedded in the price. I would argue even the regulatory risk 
like what goes on in Europe or you know what's happening here with the DOJ and the regulatory stuff. That's baked in somewhat because these companies can't acquire any other company right now. So that's embedded. But in terms of the overall China revenue going to zero, that's not embedded in the price. So clearly that is a risk. Can you explain Friday's price action, which is probably the hardest question of this conversation? Why would we down 10 percent on Nvidia on Friday, just a casual 200 billion? dollar move lower. It's a crowded trade. I mean, that if there's one trade that everyone has piled on, it's Nvidia because it's the poster child for generative AI. And, and for a good reason. The problem is at two trillion market cap, a lot of that growth is embedded in the price. And, and look, Nvidia isn't going to grow 50% for the next five years. That growth will taper. And, and I think that's why you see that kind of reaction. Do you think we might see some signs of that later in May when they report? Probably not for this quarter, given we are still supply constrained. I mean, with chips, it's all about when that supply demand equation will normalize. And it hasn't normalized based on what TSMC has told us this quarter. So I would say this quarter will probably be fine. If you thought that was a big sell off, take a look at a super microcomputer, which is essentially what some people are saying spurred it. Those shares lower by 23 percent after saying that they were going to have a date where they report earnings and they didn't give guidance. That was enough to tank the stocks. Does that give you a sense that maybe people want to sell, that maybe this actually gives you a, tells you more about the sentiment and, and some of the fear that we already see in the market? Yes, we are. And, and I'm not surprised if you go back in time with any secular trend, because we are so early in the trend and you have already picked winners, you will see that nervousness and volatility around their stock because uh, things don't go up in a straight line, especially when you are talking about 50, 60 percent growth. The law of large numbers has gotten to Nvidia, not so much for super micro, but then at the end of the day, they like they attract a lot of competition. When your stock rip up like that, it's going to attract everyone to try to break that uh, growth path that you have. So I have to be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit distracted right now because you were talking about the two buckets of tech names. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we're looking at three right now, correct? We're looking at Microsoft, we're looking at Google, and we're looking at NVIDIA. So is there a new name or a new moniker? Because right now I think that we can actually say that the Magnificent Seven is dead. Well, I don't know if it's dead because I think Alphabet for the longest time was perceived as the one which is going to get disrupted. And now the market is realizing, well, guess what? They are uh, ahead when it comes to the generative AI wave, when it comes to developing their large language model, even their cloud growth will pick up. So clearly that perception is changing and it's too early to write off Apple as well. I mean, they have a very sticky uh, ecosystem. At the end of the day, it's about the ecosystem and how sticky your revenue is. And Apple, Alphabet, it's a very sticky business Isn't model. Isn't that precisely have. what U.S. officials are trying to disrupt, the Apple ecosystem? Are you saying they won't be successful? Well, unless you just force them to open up the platform, which everyone is doing, now they have to open the Play, uh, Apple App Store and Google has to do the same on the Play Store. Well, guess what? That is somewhat uh, eating into their take rates. And so if things happening along those lines where they can't even, uh, you know, have control on their software or have control on their hardware, then it will become a problem. You them. mentioned something else as well, Mandy, but maybe we should finish there. Google changing perceptions. How have they done that? Because Gemini was a disaster. Talked about it around this table about maybe putting ideology before facts. Do you think perceptions have changed in the last few months? Absolutely. I mean, look at their market cap now. Uh, they were trading uh, like below Nvidia for a while and now they have caught up. And clearly, you know, when it comes to Alphabet, everyone realizes how strong of a moat they have when it comes to data, data that feeds into search. A lot of the large language models have pre-trained data. When it comes to live searches, you have to use Google or Bing, and Google search is much better. So that's where everyone realizes LLM is not the solution. You need real-time search, and that's Google's still moat. Big, Big fan moat. of Bing around this table, Mandeep. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg okay. Intelligence. Mandeep, thank you. Let's just go back to the Canada. I like what Mandeep just said did just then, separating some of these companies, the consumer facing companies, Tesla tomorrow after the bow, Apple later on next week, Apple and Tesla facing headwinds with the consumer and more specifically the Chinese consumer for varying reasons. They kind of have a number of different challenges. On one hand, you've got the Chinese consumer and the fact that they produce and they sell in China. 
They also have the idea of the super cycle with respect to smartphones and where we are in that and the super cycle in electric vehicles and where we are in that. So that's another thing. And then there's this third thing that we heard nothing about, which is cooling investor demand or cooling uh, consumer demand. No one's talking about that. So is it cooling? Is it heating up? Very curious to see. And you hear from some people and some investors saying Tesla and Apple both need to have a lower price target for a new, say, car or a new iPhone that could potentially then bring up this market share. Although Alex Webb said basically what happened in China won't make sense for Tesla. And also they're leaning towards India. We've seen that happen with the Apple CEO. This week, Elon Musk was supposed to meet with the Indian prime minister. And because of all the bad news that's happened, he had to basically hit pause on that. But you can see both these companies are looking at India, potentially because they're losing out in China. We're looking to Elon Musk. Tesla reporting after the bell tomorrow. Four of the Mag 7 reporting this week. It's a big week for big tech. Coming up in the next hour, Michael O'Rourke of Jones Trading, EIB president Nadia Calvino, Lara Rain of FS Investments and Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, now from New York City with equity futures near session highs, up by 0.6% and yields climbing four basis points. This is Bloomberg. The Fed is going to keep rates higher for longer and that puts more pressure on the economy. I do believe that the monetary conditions are not tight. Yes, we're probably going to have uh, slightly higher inflation, and yes, we're going to have higher interest rates, but to us, that's not that bad a problem. The economy has demonstrated that it can live with these interest rates. Financial conditions have been tightening to some degree. Overall, uh, the picture remains fairly positive. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Andrew Hodenhaw City, weight and PCE. You see what he did there? Yeah, I did. How long did Andrew work on that? You know, we can have him on and ask him. Do you think, do you think it's good? over the weekend. Really? Wait in PCE. Oh, God. Okay, PCE <laughs> coming up on Friday. Tons of tech earnings in between. We've been through the calendar already this morning. Tons to talk about after six days of losses on the S&P 500, equaling the longest daily losing streak going back to October 2022. The good news, as Lisa has already said repeatedly this morning, no Fed speak. They're in a quiet period. We're going to count you down to the Fed decision next week. And Bram, are we going to that Fed decision with them wondering out loud, are we restrictive enough? And it's been interesting to see official after official ask themselves that question. And what the potential response will be if they get the sense that maybe inflation is running too hot. I keep going back to this idea of scenario analysis and whether they give us some sense of, OK, is a hike on the table? What actually has to happen for that to be the case versus keeping rates where they are into 2025, which also would have a significant market implication. Returning from Washington, D.C., with a big conversation in the nation's capital about U.S. exceptionalism, high interest rates, big deficits, sucking capital away from everybody else and producing a much stronger U.S. dollar. Heard complaint after complaint just last week. Absolutely. And we saw this. Basically, the U.S. also tactically acknowledged that complaint, Jonathan, when Janet Yellen had that meeting with her counterparts from South Korea and Japan, that, yes, the U.S. dollar is strong. And we understand potentially if you guys have to do something about it, because at the end of the day, it's their problem. At the same time, we're talking about this. It's on the heels of over the weekend. We're on track tomorrow. Potentially, the Senate's going to pass yes for this. Nearly $100 billion, once again, coming out of the United States and going to foreign allies. Just getting that confirmation. Andrew Honhorst tomorrow, tomorrow morning, 6.45 Eastern time. We'll ask him how long it takes to come up with a title. That's one to look for. Here's another one. Tomorrow <laughs> after the bell, we'll hear from Tesla. Then earnings season starts to pick up with Meta, Microsoft and Alphabet. Into next week, we'll hear from Amazon. Then we'll hear from Apple. Then NVIDIA later on in the month of May. I love what Mandeep Singh did of Bloomberg Intelligence. Look at the consumer-facing tech names like Tesla and Apple. They've got a long list of problems. And they have to do with international issues with respect to China. But also maybe there'll be a read on just how much demand there is, how much consumer appetite there is to spend $1,500 on an iPhone. Because if you take a look at any Apple store, it looks like there's still quite a bit of appetite, at least in the United States. How much does a lack of demand elsewhere really matter? And EVs, I mean, that's its own ball of wax. I am curious about Dan Ives' view on Friday. He will be joining us and we can see whether he comes in in a suit. Well, he says this is like the Cinderella moment for Tesla on this earnings call and for Elon Musk. He calls it make or break. But to your point, he's been saying that and he's still 
over on this stock. He still thinks that there is a story to tell. I also like what Mandeep did about Microsoft. Felt like everyone's talking about the doom and gloom of Tesla. Microsoft, he says, is the only one that's really putting AI to work. And if this is a market fueled by this AI rally, well, let's see how Microsoft does. Tesla down again in the pre-market this morning. Equity features up by 0.6%. Here's the state of play for you. If you are just joining us, welcome. Yields are up by four basis points, 465.79. At the front end of the yield curve, taking out 5% briefly once again earlier on in the session. Right now up by not even a basis point to about 4 99. In the FX market, the euro a little weaker, dollar stronger. 106.34 on that currency pair, negative by 0.2%. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Michael O'Rourke of Jones Trading on what he calls an inflection point for markets. European Investment Bank President Nadia Calvino on defence spending for Ukraine. And Laura Rame of FS Investments on why she sees the 10-year retesting 5%. We begin with our top story, hot U.S. data pushing out rate cuts. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge due on Friday. Michael O'Rourke of Jones Trading saying this, financial markets are at an inflection point. The Fed's overestimation and overconfidence as to how restrictive policy is has fueled easy financial conditions and excessive risk-taking while fostering easing expectations. Michael joins us now for more. So, Michael, bearish. Fair to say based on that? Yes, yes, definitely fair to say. I mean, I think you've touched it. Even when you talk about that 10-year yield potentially going to 5%, right now for the past three weeks, the 10-year yield has been higher than the S&P 500 earnings yield. Even though the S&P 500 has corrected 6% over that time, that relationship has stayed the same because yields have continued to rise. And that just shows you you have a risk-free instrument offering you a very attractive return versus risky instruments in equities that are pretty expensive. Drawdown so far, 5% from the all-time highs of March. How much downside are you looking for? I, th I, think, there's, I, I think there's a lot of potential. I'm not going to sit there and say, um, you know, I can't put a number on it because a lot of it's driven by financial conditions, right? We've had this easy financial condition environment that has basically fostered equity prices, fostered asset prices across the board. Even the Fed's financial st stability report released on Friday talked about how equity valuations are high, historically high, how credit spreads are tight. Um, but if, the, if that relationship between treasury yields and earnings yields, uh, it's traditionally the equity, uh, you know, the, the S&P 500 earnings yield over the seven years prior to, to the pandemic was about I average 340 basis points over treasury yields. Even to just get a third of that back, the S&P 500 would drop 20%. And that's the type of risk we're talking about here that I'm not saying we're going right back to that relationship. It just gives you an idea of how expensive stocks are relative to bonds. I love this. Everyone who comes on the show today seems to think we're at an inflection point. Bob Michael also seeing a potential inflection point, but in the opposite direction, yes. Yes. a potential opportunity to buy. Why is this inflection point, in your view, going to inflect more negatively? Well, because, okay, you look at the earnings situation. We have earnings season come up. We're, t we're talking about all the big earnings this week, right? Earnings this quarter are supposed to be ba basically sequentially flat versus Q4, almost flat year over year. The big bump in earnings is supposed to come in Q2, 3, and 4, where aggregate earnings are supposed to rise 16%. Now, we're f analysts are forecasting a 16% earnings jump for those three quarters in a 5.375% Fed funds environment. You know, we're not getting the rate cuts we expected. We're not getting what the catalyst that should drive things in, you know, going forward in the economy. We've had an incredibly strong economy, and a lot of that is fiscal and monetary stimulus from the pandemic playing out over the past couple of years. So again, to expect that type of jump in earnings, it's pretty aggressive. And if you don't get that, then you realize how expensive this tape is. And do you see this idea of a sell-off in stocks that comes along with an ongoing sell-off in bonds? Sort of something that continues the divergence that you were talking about with the 10-year Treasury yield being above the S&P 500 earnings yield. Yeah, well, if you go back, you go back to the 90s and, and you know, probably the earlier 2000s, the old saying was, you know, stocks follow bonds, right? If Treasury yields were coming down that big bond bull market, stocks rallied, right? Because they're competing with each other for assets, for investment assets. So now we're seeing Treasury yields rise and basically, which means bonds are going down, and stocks should be following bonds lower here from a price perspective to keep that earnings yield for the S&P 500 somewhat competitive with, with the risk-free instrument in treasuries. And we just haven't really seen that yet, except in the last three weeks, we've seen this dip 
but they've moved together. Do any of these relationships still stand, or have we broken all of these? No, well, so that's, so that's the interesting thing. If you go back to late 90s, the, tre you know, the Treasury yield was, cons the earnings, S&P 500 earnings yield was consistently lower than the Treasury yield, but that was a, that was, you know, during the great moderation as, in, as inflation was, you know, coming down, you know, for, for basically decades at that point. And bonds were just, you know, cautious or investors were, were late to follow. This is the inverse situation where we're seeing inflation's more sticky. We're seeing a structurally different economy than we've seen from 2000 to 2020. You say that the Fed policy does not need to change this point, but communication does. What are they getting wrong when they're speaking to the market? Well, I think they're just taking what they're seeing in front of them and they're, they're being overconfident in what they're seeing. So in 2020, when the story was, it's transitory. And we heard that for a year. When the Fed finally raised interest rates, core PC had actually peaked in February of 2022. The, you know, the Fed raised rates in March and they finally ended QE in March. They were late and they were too confident for too long. So for the, since last summer, we've heard policy is restrictive, policy is restrictive. But it, it hasn't been. In Q3, we put up a 5% GDP print. At that point, the Fed has to go back to themselves and say, we're missing something in this economy. And they, instead of doing that, they continue to say policy is restrictive. And they keep this estimate of the long-term you know, long Fed funds rate down at 2.5%, which is only a 50 basis point you know, real neutral rate, whereas even the New York Fed's DSG model has it at 2%. So they're basically going off of a, you know, a forecast that interest rates are going back to lower levels or the market's taking their forecast. They don't actually even believe it anymore and saying, oh, this is where we're going in the future so we can keep equity valuations inflated a little bit higher. We start hearing some Fed officials talk about whether or not they are actually restrictive though. And Michelle Bowman last week said we're restrictive, but we might not be sufficiently restrictive. What's the difference? Oh, it's, it's massive because if you're underestimating or, you're, or if you're overestimating how restrictive you are, then you're, you're making a policy mistake because policy is far looser than you believe it to be. So that is why, you know, over the past three quarters, if you include what this uh, Q1 is going to look like, we've put up, we, I think we've averaged GDP of about 3.6% which is double the Fed's long-term forecast of U.S. potential GDP. Um, it's funny, Chairman, uh, Chairman Powell talks about the risks being in balance now. If you go back to pre-pandemic, when we had 1.8% you know, core PCE, the Fed was willing to do anything to push inflation up to 2% and micromanage there. Here we're at 2.8% PCE. We're talking about things being in balance. Meanwhile, the unemployment rate's 3.8% which is 30 basis points lower than the Fed's long-term target of 4.1%. So we're still in an inflationary environment per the guidance they give, per their models, per their forecast, but they don't talk about it like that. All they've talked about for the past six months is cutting rates until the past couple of weeks. So why should I just buy stocks? There's no sign of them hiking anytime soon. Growth is good, inflation's sticky, top line growth's gonna be solid off the back of that. Why wouldn't I be a buyer here? Well, it's funny. I, I, um, I know when you guys had Torsten Slock in and Tom King talks about it, he talks about it's a GDP-driven event. Sure. And he is, he is right about that. And that is, that is something I agree with. I think the risk here is we've had so many people chasing these rate cuts, chasing these, these higher valuations that I think we're due for that correction at this point, as long as these Treasury yields continue to rise. If Treasury yields stabilize here, I'll, I'll start to reevaluate. But once that risk-free instrument starts to become more attractive, I think you're due for an equity correction. Very close to 5% this morning on a two-year 498.64. Michael, enjoyed it. It's good to see you. Thank you. It's been too long. It's like years in person since we've done this. <laughs> Michael O'Rourke there. Thank you, sir. Equity is just about positive by 0.4%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Opening arguments in former President Donald Trump's criminal trial are set to begin today after jury selection finished on Friday. The unprecedented case centers on Mr. Trump's efforts to cover up a sex scandal involving a hush money payment to porn, former porn star Stormy Daniels. According to the latest filings, the former president spent $4.9 million on legal fees in March and has just $6.8 million left in the accounts he's been using to fund his lawyers. 
classes at Columbia University will be head vir held virtually today after reports of anti-Semitic statements and actions on campus. Anti-Semitism at the pro-Palestinian demonstrations is drawing backlash from members of Congress and the White House. Columbia, the latest institution on the radar of Congress people after its treatment of anti-Semitism after Harvard, MIT and Penn all came under intense scrutiny last year. Columbia's president said leaders would come together today to discuss a way to end the crisis. And the ECB won't be swayed from cutting rates in June, even if there's uncertainty over oil prices. That according to the Bank of France Governor Francois Villeroy. Earlier this morning, I spoke with Jane Foley of Rabobank, who said that despite concerns over rate differentials, if the U.S. doesn't cut or cuts later this year, Europe would welcome a weaker euro. The euro? It's quite possible that a weaker euro will actually be welcome, particularly if you're in a country like Germany. I would imagine that a period of a weak euro could actually be welcomed, given the hit to the manufacturing in, in, in Germany in particular mm. uh, and, and the impact of the last few years of the energy crisis. And you can watch Bloomberg Brief every morning at 5 a.m. John. Danny, thank you. Great exchange there. Thank you very much. Heard that a few times about a weaker euro and Europe being welcomed. Up next on the programme, Western allies reinforcing support for Ukraine. This support will really strengthen the armed forces of Ukraine. And we will have a chance for victory if Ukraine really gets the weapon system, which we need so much. A conversation up next on the programme, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. from New York City. Welcome to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500 positive by 0.4%. Moves again in the bond market. Yields up three basis points on a 10-year. 4.65 on a two-year this morning. Breaching 5% a little bit earlier. 4.99 right now. Under surveillance this morning, Western allies reinforcing support for Ukraine. I would like to say thanks to Speaker Johnson and President Biden. Indeed, it is so important, this support from the United States of America. We will have a chance for victory if Ukraine really gets the weapons system, which we need so much. It's not only about the territory. It's about ourselves, our identity. So we cannot lose hope. Here's the latest this morning. The U.S. House approving more than $60 billion in aid to Ukraine. The Senate sets a vote on the package tomorrow. Those funds coming on top of the European Investment Bank announcing it will allocate over $590 million to Ukraine this year, with the money set to fund housing, energy and infrastructure projects. European Investment Bank President Nadia Calvino is here in New York with us for more. President Calvino, good to see you. Very good to see you. Great too. to catch up once again. You're back from Washington, D.C. We are as well, so maybe we can compare notes. Oh. We've talked a long time about a lack of cooperation, maybe, worldwide, a breakdown between the United States and what the Europeans need and what Ukraine ultimately wants. Did you sense the same thing at all in Washington? Are we coming together or moving apart? We're definitely coming together. Indeed, I think it was a very productive spring meetings week. We had many exchanges and I really see a momentum in coming together and supporting Ukraine very strongly, but also deepening our cooperation within the multilateral development bank family to contribute to climate change financing, uh, peaceful and a more how would I say, sustainable world going forward. We'll get some more details on your lending plans in just a moment. There has been a sense of fatigue in Congress around what is happening with Ukraine in its war, its fight against Russia. There are some people asking whether there, there is a different way, whether this should be something we continue with, stick with, continue funding what looks like maybe a nether-ending war. What would your view on that argument be? Well, absolutely. We need to support Ukraine. It is, uh, it is a, a, a very serious situation that we are living. It's a threat to democracy at the end of the day. And, and the way we see things, I think, in the US and, and Europe too. And so from the European point of view, there's no doubt our support to Ukraine is unwavering. I think the decision that has been taken by the US to provide uh, support for more than $60 billion is very valuable. And this joins also the previous decision of the European institutions to provide $50 billion 
billion euros in the Ukraine facility, which we will manage at the European Investment Bank. And I think it will provide much, uh, much valuable support for the reconstruction as well as the military effort, of course. But President, did you see the vote counts on those aid bills? So when you look at something like the Indo-Pacific, it was 385 to 234 in the House. When it comes to Israel, it was 311 to 112. It barely got through when it came, sorry, excuse me, to Ukraine. Okay. How concerned are you about how deeply divided U.S. politicians are about aiding Ukraine over, say, other issues like Israel and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I really think that we should continue to support Ukraine. As uh, President Zelensky was just saying on the screen, they have a chance uh, if we continue to support them. From the European point of view, you know, Ukraine is our neighbor. It is a, a prospective member of the family, if I can say it this way. And thus, we need to ensure that we keep a secure environment in the region. Uh, the other conflicts are just as important. I mean, the Middle East situation is very, is very worrying. It's a source of concern for all of us. And we should try to stop that war and that, that conflict, you know, as soon as possible. But Ukraine should not be forgotten. But in the numbers, it shows that Ukraine was the hardest one for lawmakers to get through. What does this mean, potentially, if you were, say, to deal with a different administration, a Trump administration? Well, I wouldn't like to speculate on, on U.S. politics and I wouldn't dare to comment on the internal wheelings and dealings. But I think the most important news we have today is this got through more than 60 billion euros uh, dollars support and this will provide a very valuable support to Ukraine at a crucial point in the in the conflict in the war. President Kavino, how much is this actually uh, the uncertainty helping you to raise money for military efforts within Europe to bolster military spending within the continent? Well, it's obvious that, you know, some people woke up to the fact that we were uh, more fragile than maybe we thought because of the war in Ukraine and the uh, unwarranted uh, aggression by Russia. Many member states, the frontline member states, I think, were already wide awake and very aware of the challenge of having this kind of neighbor. But, uh, you know, it is, it, it is absolutely clear we need to step up and support Europe's uh, security and defense industry. And the European Investment Bank can play a role in that. When you talk about financing it, how much are you on board with the idea of monetizing Russian assets that are harbored in Europe, maybe in tandem with the United States in terms of coming up with some sort of plan? Hmm. It's very important, I think, that we act united. And so the G7 discussions are extremely valuable so that we move ahead as one. Uh, of course, the situation is not comparable between the US and, the, and Europe in terms of the volume of assets we are discussing. And on the European side, we are making progress. The European Commission has put forward a step-by-step -step, uh, plan. And, and so, you know, we're making some progress in making sure that these assets are put to, uh, to good use in supporting Ukraine. In supporting Ukraine, does it also include in investing in some of the military development in Europe? I think this is a bit, uh, you know, uh, too, too soon to say how, how is the, the best use of these assets. Just see that we are really unwavering in our support to the country and we're making progress in mo mobilizing all sources of financing to provide that um, important support. When it comes to the Russian assets, particularly the ones in Europe, there's lots of different things being thrown around on how to actually monetize it. Do you expect a decision when the leaders meet in June in Puglia? I, I certainly think this is going to be on the table. And there it is a different issue to talk about the assets than talking about the proceeds coming from those assets. I think there is more unanimity on the second than the former. Uh, many considerations are on the table and we need to calibrate well our decisions so as to make sure that there are no uh, unwarranted uh, side effects. I just wanted to wrap things up, President Calvino, with the changes you've proposed to the EIB, which is a plan to ultimately make it easier to fund defence projects. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? What can we expect? Are these changes going to go through? I, I certainly think so, yes. Uh, for the past eight years, we've been already financing Europe's security and defence industry. Uh, what we are doing now is adapting our lending policy whilst preserving a very strong financing capability, capacity. I mean, the EIB has a triple A plus uh, uh, consideration in the market. We are a very strong player in financial markets. Only last week we had an auction. I was following your, your programme this morning and, you know, I was. Um, it, it is impressive because last week we did a five-year uh, bond of five billion issuance, which was heavily oversubscribed, around 21 billion euros in demand. And we closed with an interest rate that was just 10 basis points over the US Treasury. So that, wow. you know, shows uh, the, the important um, 
financing capacity of the bank. And this is what allows us to be very competitive in financing our clients, public and private clients, and contributing to growth and prosperity in Europe and, and beyond. So we really need to, to calibrate our response as well. So far, the market is responding as we had anticipated, and I think we certainly will step up our support to Europe's security and defence. Just a final comment, if we can. You, of course, were part of the Spanish government for a little while. I'm used to calling you minister. Mm -hmm. I want to get your thoughts on whether the defence spending will overwhelm the capital that could be used for developing the European economy more broadly. Are you concerned about that? in any way, shape or form? Well, certainly, that's why I said a moment ago we need to mobilise all our funding sources so as to make sure that funding our uh, security and defence effort, contributing to peace at the end of the day, is not weakening our support to social infrastructures, innovation, the digitalisation and, of course, climate action, which is a top priority and, and the key challenge of our time. Nadia, it's good to see you. Thanks for dropping by. Very good. Thank you very much. Enjoy, enjoy New York. Nadia Calvino there of the European Investment Bank. I think we started that promo in the right place. Lisa, talking about the sense of cooperation. It felt like there wasn't much over the last year or so. It looks like we've moved a little bit closer together. But to Anne-Marie's point, you can still see the cracks down in Washington. Which is a reason why maybe there's renewed focus on trying to finance Europe's own effort at a time where a lot of people are saying there was so much reliance on the US that you were able to unleash some of that funding for some of these other programs. Up next on the program, we'll catch up with Laura Rehm of FS Investments, looking ahead to this week's data, including the PCE deflator. That's coming on Friday. Live from New York, if you're just tuning in, equities near session highs, positive 0.4%. This is Bloomberg. Here's the state of play. Big week ahead. Equity's doing OK to start this morning at least. Positive by 0.5% on the S&P 500. More than 40% of the market cap on the S&P reporting earnings this week. It kicks off in a big way with Tesla after the close tomorrow. Nasdaq futures positive by 0.5%. The Nasdaq 100 with its worst day of the year on Friday attempting to snap back. The Russell to small caps doing OK as well. Up a half of 1%. That's the equity board. Switch up the board and turn to the bond market. Bramo with plenty to say on the supply this week. Let's go through those numbers again. We're looking for a two-year, $30 billion worth tomorrow. The day after, $70 billion of five-year notes. The following day, $44 billion, Lisa, of seven-year notes. How much demand is there going to be? Do we see uh, sort of some of that trickle in? You know, Bob Michael, I keep going back to this. He is a bond bull. He sees it as the best buying environment going back to the early 2000s. And yet he's waiting, right? Or is everybody else on the sidelines waiting too when we see these auctions? And then could you see some real messiness that spurs uh, additional kind of selling going forward? He's looking for the washout to continue through the next couple of weeks. He used to say things like, don't get greedy. Don't get greedy and wait for the extra 20 basis points of spread widening by now. That's what he would say. It's changed. What, now he's saying get greedy. <laughs> Get greedy. Wait a Think few about weeks it. into a month then you know, for a washout. This has been part of the problem. How do you fight against momentum? And right now it feels like everyone is saying an inflection point is here. And so we don't know which way the, the momentum is going to shift. And that, I think, is what has some investors a bit concerned. That's the bond market. Let's turn to foreign exchange. More recently, higher yields biting into the FX market, eating away at G10, taking out currencies like the euro down to about 106. The dollar at the strongest levels we've seen all year through Friday. And we're seeing a little bit more dollar strength again this morning. How far can you push this? I think it's what RBC's Al Salinas was trying to say a little bit earlier, which is, OK, we've got all the information. How much more can you expect? Especially since we've already almost wiped out all of the seven rate cuts are barring uh, fewer than two for the remainder of this year. What more can we get in terms of hawkish uh, data, hawkish pronouncements from the Federal Reserve that could shift this relationship? Honestly, this is a good question. Do we still have dollar bears that are basically not capitulating yet, who are holding up the euro in this kind of relationship? We've done a lot of work in the rates market over the last few months, that's for sure. Under surveillance, your top stories, TikTok's time is running out. The House passing of foreign aid package including a provision requiring parent company ByteDance to divest the platform or face a ban. The Senate expected to vote in the coming days. President Biden and Marie saying he will sign the legislation. And already we're seeing reports about what TikTok's um, head of public policy head in the United States is saying. And in, in to staff, they're saying the legislation is a clear violation of the First Amendment rights of TikTok's 170 million American users. We'll continue that fight, a.k.a. if this goes through, prepare for the legal battles that will continue to happen. But... 
TikTok, now this is at a level where it's not thinking about banning or divesting. This potentially is going to be law. And then there's a number of different avenues that can happen. Well, ByteDance and TikTok specifically are not entertaining one part of the story. What you'll hear them always talk about is the ban. What you hear the politicians talk about, well, hang on, it's ban or divest, you can divest this. I see no appetite so far. And clearly this is part of the argument they're trying to make to the consumer base in the United States to try and lobby the government. Zero appetite, not entertaining it in any way, shape or form that they would divest that app. China's flat out said they are not going to allow a sale. Dan Ives is expecting there to be a sale, but without the algorithm attached, which raises this question, what will TikTok look like? And he's suggesting Microsoft is the best position to potentially take it over. Again, though, Ultimately, China wants this to look like the U.S. is anti-free speech. They want people to be angry. What's China? So well, it's China that blocks WhatsApp. But they overnight. say it all the time. That I mean, do blocks, they? I'm not blocks saying blocks out television networks if they mention the Chinese Communist Party. I do think that yes, potentially China is coming out and they're saying we will not allow a sale. They are going to negotiate from this position of strength. I'm of sure course. this show just went to black in China. It'll come back up in just a moment when we start talking about other things. We're not on it. Max China. 7 earnings set to steal the spotlight this week. Tesla reporting tomorrow. The EV maker under pressure as it cuts prices in China once again. <laughs> Investors worrying about CEO Elon Musk's focus on the robo taxi. Earnings continuing Wednesday with Meta and Thursday with Alphabet and Microsoft as well. Brammer, that's four of the big seven. And really, the key question is to me, if we're at this inflection point, and yes, I'm still on that, what is this information going to give us in terms of whether this is a buy the dip moment or whether this is just the beginning of a washout that can continue? Ultimately, I do think that the idea of Alphabet and Microsoft really does loom large for me. How are you deploying artificial intelligence? If there is a sign, it isn't being deployed as quickly as people thought in the hopes and dreams of ChatGPT. Could that shift the narrative? Or are we just looking at, again, the thunderous three? I mean, ultimately, I just keep going back to this. I don't rebrand. see it. Well, I, I really do see this as a rebrand moment. <laughs> does any of this matter until the end of May when we get NVIDIA? I kept which Goldman, about this. When Goldman Sachs know. says it's the most important stock on earth? I won't try and be contrarian about this, I think, as it has been for a long, long time. Apple for me. I just want to know what Apple did next week. Big struggle in places like China. We've always been talking about the end of Apple and the dominance of the smartphone. Things are lining up in the wrong way for that company. You think of the pushback in Washington, D.C., the consumer pushback in China. They always seem to be able to pull it off. Whenever those doubts start to build, they're able to sort of blow them up and carry on and stocks go to new highs and they've got that massive capital return program supporting the name. I just wonder how different things will feel next week. Especially because China's a big question mark and what's the next big thing? Can they compete with artificial intelligence? Ultimately, I, every time I doubt Apple, I look at the line outside of an Apple store of people waiting for the privilege to drop thousands of dollars on little goods for them and their kids. And you think, OK, how can I be contrarian against this? But do we start to talk about a new paradigm like you're talking about with artificial intelligence? And is Samsung going to get the upper hand? I don't know. Siri on steroids is what we're looking for later this year. Is that right? Well, do you actually use Siri? Ever? No, never have done. Never I mean, have done. I, I honestly, it's it's not fun for me. I use Siri only when I don't want to use Shazam. So what is the name of this song? You can just ask Shir Siri. It's easier than downloading Shazam. I will say, though, over the weekend, Mark Gurman put out a note saying that what Apple needs is a true low-end iPhone. And that is the only way they're going to be able to revive growth. Apple positive in the free market by 0.6%. Another read on inflation later on this week. The Fed's preferred gauge, the PCE deflator, coming on Friday. Bloomberg survey expecting core PCE to call slightly year over year to 2.7%. The data likely to confirm that progress on inflation has stalled, supporting a shift from Fed officials that rates will stay higher for longer. Laura Rehm of FS Investments joins us now for more. Laura, you've been talking about this for a while. Looks like Fed officials are coming to your side of the boat and starting to think about whether we are truly restrictive. Laura, one thing you said to us last time we spoke was the prospect of surgical cuts. They were still on the table for you later this year. Is that still the case? It is because I think the Fed is really determined. And that to me is the difference between uh, really staying on hold or deciding that they want to take this plunge into the rate cut pool. They've been stating that they want to for a long time. And I think it would take a really big revision higher in their sort of R star estimates to get us to a place where they really feel comfortable staying on hold. But, you know, the data could continue to surprise to the upside. I, I get caught in this sort of question of do I think they should cut or will they cut? 
And again, it just seems like really the best argument today is that they want to. And, you know, you still hear that through the like, maybe we have to wait rhetoric that has now bubbled up to the top. So, Lara, I do wonder then how we've reset the bar. You said there is scope for upside surprises still. I just wonder how little or how much it would actually take to reintroduce a conversation at this Fed to cut interest rates sometime soon, perhaps as soon as July. So, you know, what we need to see is this core, um, you know, sort of super core uh, shelter and then the other piece of the services um, inflation picture really reducing. Because today we're in a situation where goods prices have come down. Uh, I think we'd also need to see the wages piece. So it's not just one data point, it's really the collection. The same collection that really did behave so well in Q2 and Q3 of last year. But that's not my expectation. My expectation is that they continue to be stubborn. I think the Fed could very well see the other impetus being housing really cratering more. We've just gotten some pretty nasty housing data. And I think that could be a place, too, where the argument comes in that we do just need to help that market along a little bit. And I think, finally, the third the third leg of the answer there is the 10-year. I expect the 10-year to retest 10%, 5% sometime this year. But if we get there really fast and the volatility in long-term rates feels out of control, I think the Fed could come back in dovish just to try to cool down the volatility in that market. You know, another thing that you said, Laura, that I thought was fascinating is, can markets live with higher rates? And your answer is yes, uh, absolutely. And that's what you've seen in the market, which raises the question not about near-term communication from the Fed, but longer term, how high rates could be if they are dovish even and cut rates once, that basically we're looking even at a five-handle Fed funds rate, if not, you know, 475 for the foreseeable future. Is that the reality that you're looking at? It is because think about a world where we avoid a recession. I very much expect that we're in that world and hope that we are. This inverted yield curve has got to renormalize. And to me, it's a combination of these surgical rate cuts and longer term rates drifting higher. And so, you know, this is not altogether a bad thing. A normal yield curve would be welcome for our banking system. And really, I think it would show that we have sort of finally reached a normal, healthy uh, outlook in the bond market. But long-term rates are something that we can, higher long-term rates are something we can learn to li live with. And I think companies will start to bake that in. And that is what we're seeing across the board. It's going to take time. And I think it speaks to the need to quell volatility in long-term rates at the same time allowing them to make a controlled move higher. And I think that's what we've really seen until the last month or so. That's what has hit markets somewhat, that and uncertainty around policy. Laura, what are you more interested in this week? Uh, the PCE data that we get on Friday in terms of also personal spending and income, or what we hear from companies, uh, the 178 that are reporting earnings this week? I think companies, because this is another feature of this market. If growth is strong enough and they're expecting demand to be strong enough, that can offset the problems or the funding pressures that higher interest rates can give us. So, you know, you asked, we, we, there's been a lot of talk about AI, adopting AI throughout the earnings conversations of the Magnificent Seven. And to me, this is a, a really interesting place where what is good for the economy is not always good for earnings because investment spending plans, which are going to be required, right, to implement AI, that's great for economic growth. And I think really could continue this virtuous cycle of slightly higher rates and stronger growth that's not necessarily good for free cash flow margin. And that could impact uh, earnings going forward. So this is, uh, I think, something we're going to see this dynamic play out this week. And I think it'll be fascinating. Laura, we're seeing a reprieve in the oil market. But for now, is what many investors are saying, if we see closer to $100 a barrel, how much is that going to impact profitability companies are able to have? To me, that's a huge uh, threshold point. And one of the risks to the economy that I'm looking at is commodity prices, specifically energy prices. Oil at $100 a barrel, companies really seem to feel like they're 
animal spirits are deeply impacted at that threshold. And $5 a gallon for the household is a really critical threshold as well. That seems to be a psychological breaking point for uh, households and their monthly budgets. Lara, what would you expect from the Fed next week, just in terms of the conversation, the tone of the news conference? You know, QT is finally, I think, going to be walked back. It's something that we're not talking about very much, but I think that is going to be a the bigger policy shift. And I think they're still going to leave themselves room for flexibility when they talk about the economy and markets. So that is going to be more uh, of a dominant feature than sort of slamming the door on rate cuts or taking a more definitive tone. I think it's going to be, you know, not now, but probably later and they're still going to keep that maximum flexibility language. Lara, wonderful to get your perspective on things. Lara Reim there of FS Investments following a big repricing of the bond market. Stunning. More than 70 basis points higher at the front end of the curve. And this game that we often play. If I told you, if I told you we'd be up 70 basis points at the front end, I'm not sure you'd have four percentage points against on the S&P. I think we'd be down 10%. Well, let me tell you, Michael O'Rourke had a point yes, just a, a couple minutes ago that I thought was fascinating about how the 10-year Treasury yield is now above and has been above the S&P 500 earnings yield for three straight weeks. The last time that it was above uh, the S&P 500 earnings yield was 2002. So it raises this question, OK, well, then which is going to bite first? Is it going to be a stock sell off that brings that more into some sort of right? Or is it going to be uh, some sort of bond market rally akin to what Bob Michael was talking about? The competition for capital continues 463 on a U.S. 10 year right now, up just about a single basis point on the session. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. UBS is cutting the big six tech stocks ahead of their upcoming earnings. Jonathan Golub downgraded Apple, Amazon, Meta, Alphabet, Microsoft and NVIDIA all to neutral from previously overweight. The team wrote in a note to clients that the companies are losing earnings momentum and face tough comps. UBS says the downgrade doesn't apply to the rest of the sector. And of the big tech names, plenty of focus on NVIDIA. It suffered its biggest drop in four years on Friday and the highest put volume since 2017. RBC's Amy Wu Silverman told me this morning that the left tail is finally waking up. In terms of NVIDIA, it's just about weightiness, you know, so it's this idea of maybe positioning wise, people have gotten long, people have dipped their toe in the water, they have jumped in the pool. So, of course, there's simply more to hedge. But there's also this idea that if tech goes, the market goes. And she spoke with me on The Brief, which you can watch every morning at 5 a.m. Eastern. Mexico's leading presidential candidate, Claudia Shabam, is confident that she'll have a strong relationship with either Donald Trump or Joe Biden ahead of the elections for both countries. Both Trump and Biden have pushed for tougher restrictions on immigration at the Mexican border. She and Baum told Bloomberg the best path forward was to cooperate on economic development. I think it will be good. I think it will be good whether President Biden or President Trump wins. We have a very strong economic integration with the United States. We are now the principal trading partner, and that requires us to have a good relationship. Now, I think that obviously we are always going to defend Mexicans abroad. We are not in favor of any discriminatory discourse, but there is going to be a good relationship. That's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. I love this note from Jonathan Golub. Golub, come on a program. Need to talk about this. Downgrading the big six maintaining the overweight to the rest of tech. What's left of it? After you've downgraded Apple, Amazon, Google, Meta, Microsoft and Nvidia, what's left of it? A lot of smaller companies that nobody has heard of and that maybe they uh, can be catch a bid after not rallying this to the same degree. That UBS note <laughs> catching a lot of eyes this morning. Up next on the program, it's Tesla's tipping point. There's a lot to look forward to in 2024. Uh, Tesla is currently between two major growth waves. We're focused on making sure that our next growth wave driven by next-gen vehicle, energy storage, full self-driving and other projects is executed as well as possible. That conversation up next, live from New York, this is Bloomberg. <music> 41 minutes away from the opening bell, equities positive by 0.6% on the S&P, yields higher by two basis points, 463 
94. Under Savannah's this morning, it's Tesla's tipping point. Here's the latest. Tesla shares sliding nearly 41% this year due to slumping sales, price cuts and increased competition in China. The CEO, Elon Musk, also seeming to change course. Sources telling Bloomberg that Musk is staking the future of his company on a robo-taxi, a project that Tesla does not have the infrastructure for. Bloomberg's Ed Blood, though, joins us now for more. Ed, you've covered this story so well over the last few years. What's the big one you're looking for tomorrow afternoon? Well, it's good timing. Uh, you know, we write in the big take that, that a company that's accustomed to chaos has kind of reached a threshold of chaos to which they're unaccustomed. And so the earnings call is everything. Um, I think it's just clarity. Um, you know, what we're reporting is that, yes, a robo taxi is the priority. But where is it at? You know, it's one thing to set a date for August 8th. The assumption being they'll unveil a prototype. But what is the plan for that? And then I think we did give some clarity in that big take around the idea of a $25,000 EV. I think the world was kind of expecting Tesla to come with the kind of Honda Civic of the EV world. And my understanding is that that's just not the case. They did a lot of work uh, at the component level with technology and the production level to work out how they could wring out cost. Classic Elon Musk. And my understanding is that that project was successful. It continues. And actually what they will do long term is apply that work to cost savings on their existing cars, offer them more cheaply. Um, I guess we will see whether we're right on Tuesday when he takes that call. It takes us to margins. Let's talk about margins. The stock is down yeah. by close to 5% in the pre-market yeah. this morning. I think a lot of us were willing to give the company the benefit of doubt. When the price cuts first started, they've got the margins. They can squeeze the competition, prevent them from taking market share, just as they go through a very expensive ramp up in production at legacy automakers. I think we all understood that argument. Where's that argument now, Ed? Yeah, the, the, the margin debate puts your eye very closely on China. Um, you know, the price cuts there is, are interesting because the, the reaction from the sell side, at least, is to start to worry that some of the most profitable cars that Tesla makes in China will not be even break even, uh, let alone have positive EBIT. And, and it's really interesting economics, right? Model Y is basically the world's best selling car or SUV. And what I learned in the last seven days is that in China, two thirds of what they sell is the lowest spec rear wheel drive Model Y. So its margin profile is less, but because China's supply chain um, and cost of production is so much lower, the bill of materials are lower, it's a much more profitable uh, thing. That's changing, so we're a little bit worried about that. Um, Zach Kirkhorn, who you remember left as CFO in August, he was the bottom line magician. You know, that was his focus. And my understanding is that actually all of these cuts we're going through, the layoffs, all the stuff that's happening, Musk's motivation is actually not the bottom line or cost at all. It's simply psychological, which we can get into. But I think that's the point, that the, the investors are looking at this going, what are you focused on here? Why are you letting the bottom line unravel? You know, price cuts have been a useful lever, but they continue without an end at the moment. What's demon mode, Ed? Yeah, demon mode or wartime CEO mode. Um, and this is what I'm hearing. So let's take the layoffs as an example. I'm told that Musk looked at the 1Q delivery performance where deliveries fell 20% sequentially and completely outside of financial consideration, he basically said, okay, if deliveries drop 20%, we should cut headcount by 20% just to keep everybody on their toes, just to keep everyone in a state of paranoia where they know that if we're too big, that would be bad. And this is classic Elon right now. Um, I also get the sense that He's been a bit busy recently with some other companies, and I think he's kind of come back to Tesla quite recently and looked at what's going on and doesn't like it. And so he's getting more hands on now, focus on RoboTaxi. Um, and, and just to, to kind of plug the reporting one final time, I think they're making a lot of progress on the software side um, with RoboTaxi. But now he's like, this is my vision. And if you don't like it, you're out. Okay, but Ed, when you think about when I think of the robo tax, I think of Uber self driving cars. Arizona's yeah. former governor wanted them all to come in, and then there was a tragic death, and then Uber had to sell this off. How risky is betting the entire farm on robo taxis? It, it, it's risky, but all you can do is, is bring the horse to water, right? You know, Elon Musk is going to make a robo taxi. Elon Musk is often late against his own timelines, but 
pretty much always delivers on the thing that he says he's going to do. One interesting departure of the last seven days was Tesla's public policy chief, Rowan Patel. He would have been the person that would have to go to the regulators and say, well, we have a robo-taxi. Are you going to let us use it in the real world? And my sense is that he thought, my goodness, it's not worth it for me. I don't think that that's a straightforward battle to have. So you're completely right. Tesla will operationally do what it can to make a prototype of a standalone robo-taxi, develop the software, and I believe they're making progress in the domain of specific software for a robo-taxi. But the rest of it is out of their hands from the regulators' point of view. And as we've learned through Cruise and Waymo, even the most prudent and, and, and safe approaches are still fraught with risk. Um, because the regulators have a low threshold for, for pain or, or, or problems along the way. And just a final one, do you think this is yes. a Tesla problem or a sector problem? Uh, from an EV standpoint, in, in terms of demand, I think it's, it's pretty much both. Um, you know, Tesla, whether uh, people like it or not, has the specific problem of reputational risk and Elon Musk's behaviour at, ma- at the moment. That is... Uh, tangibly having an impact on consumer demand. But again, why are they sort of focusing on a robo taxi? Because right now the market for EVs, early adopters, it's been and gone. Um, you know, what I'm hearing overnight, for example, is that they've kind of already given up on this nascent marketing effort to, to do traditional marketing and advertising. Yep. And investors had pushed for that because they wanted people who don't know anything about Tesla to know about it. Uh, This was great. We'll catch up again tomorrow. Looking forward to the program a little bit later. Bloomberg Technology, 11 Eastern time. Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Coming up tomorrow, we'll catch up with the SAP CFO. We'll speak to Citi's Andrew Hollenhorst. He says wait and PCE. Yeah. You, you like that? Yeah, Enough I think that, it's awesome. Don't you? I know. I do. I'm going to say it all day. JP Morgan's Priya Misra is going to be joining us together with Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson. A lot to talk about. 34 minutes away from the opening bow. Equity futures positive by 0.6%. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.